Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day, wherever you are in the world today. We have an international group, and I'm very excited to share this time with Fred Luskin, the author of Forgive for Good. Anybody uh, out there that's had any exposure to me at all knows that I endorse that book very highly and more about that later on. Uh, I'm an alcoholic, I'm in a 12 step program and I've had an experience with uh, our topic today, forgiveness. I met Fred 10, 20 years ago probably. And of course he wrote the book. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And a little bit more about that in a minute. This uh, event, uh, is supported and uh, administered by the Mary and Joseph Retreat Center, which is a, a local retreat center to where I live in Rancho Palos Verdes, California, about a mile away. And um, it's very supportive of the 12 step work as well as a very broad, uh, inclusive spiritual work. So lots of different people from different religious traditions or no traditions at all uh, will rent out the space at the retreat center here in Palos Verdes. They have accommodations for 60 people overnight and um, it's on eight acres. Half of it overlooks the city, half of it overlooks the ocean. It's just like, it's a jewel in the midst of the Southern California civilization. Uh, Fred, I think you're with us and maybe you could introduce yourself. Um, Fred Luskin from Northern California. Hello everyone. Um, I am in Northern California. Um, I run something called the Stanford University Forgiveness Project. That's why I have the picture of Stanford behind me. Um, that's not actually why I have the picture of Stanford behind me. They get tense sometimes if you do official Stanford things and don't look like you're just sitting in your house. They don't. They frown upon people looking like they're in their house wearing T-shirts. So they they ask him to stick Stanford behind them um, to make it seem more um, responsible. Um, I've developed a secular method of forgiveness that um, pretty much, I believe, aligns with all the major religions of the world, just... Um, try to use the language of psychology and behavioral medicine rather than more religious spiritual knowledge or words. But um, we've been teaching forgiveness to people all over the world in some of the most horrific places. And um, I mean, the bottom line is you can teach people to forgive and people can learn to forgive and it's good for them. So I, I've known Herb for a long time, and he asked me to come sit in while he talks and then um, maybe spend a little time showing you what it is that we do when we teach forgiveness. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Uh, it was about 20 years ago, actually. Uh, Fred was invited to share his thoughts on forgiveness at a panel in the desert Palm Springs and uh, from the psychological aspect, as you heard Fred called it the secular aspect, the scientific aspect. And I was asked to share my experience on forgiveness from the spiritual and 12 step perspective. And I, of course I read his book in advance of the uh, panel. And then we did the panel. Uh, it seemed to go over well. And this is the story that certainly impresses me. And I hope it at least gives a context for today. And uh, afterwards, Fred and I were talking, meeting for the very first time. And I said, you know, Fred, uh, thank you very much for, you know, sharing your thoughts and the work that you're doing. Uh, I have done this work out of a 12-step 
process. And what I have found is listening to you and reading your book is that the dynamics under the process of forgiveness are the same. The dynamics, the process itself, it's very, very parallel. The words and vocabulary, of course, are different. And he said, yes, it's, it's really a, an amazing human phenomena that we have that parallel. He says, but you 12-steppers and spiritual people have a little bit of an advantage. I think I'm remembering this correctly. I, I never uh, actually allow facts to get in the way of a good story. But uh, anyway, uh, Fred, I believe, said, yeah, but you spiritual people, you 12-step people have a real advantage because you have a higher power, and that adds a component to it for you that we don't have in the secular scientific. So at some point when he's talking, maybe he can address that. Um, today, we're going to talk about forgiveness. I'm going to put up a slide, and um, I'm going to conduct a PowerPoint uh, to guide me in my comments. My experience with it is that it's a process, and I, I mean that it, it takes a while. Um, I was four years sober in a 12-step program when I worked the steps, the 12 steps, out of what we call the big book called Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the name of the book, and um, it's a precise textbook on the step process, which I had never been uh, really aware of in terms of its depth and its application. And at the end of that 12-month process, working those 12 steps, and that wasn't a step a month, that was just a process that took that amount of time. Um, I looked back on my experience and I was asked to look up the word forgiveness in a dictionary. And I had finished my ninth step. A little bit more about that in a minute, if you're not familiar with it. But I had finished my ninth step right around the 12 month mark, finishing the work I was doing with this man who I called a step guide. He wasn't a friend, he wasn't a sponsor, he was a project manager. And he had me look up the word forgiveness because he wanted me to be conscious of the experience that I'd had, knowing that I probably wasn't aware of it, but that I had just had the experience. And I looked up the word and it, it tells me in the dictionary that forgiveness, among other things, is a decision to release. And, and I have adopted this. Look at my hand here, if you can see me on the screen. A decision to release. For me, that gave me such a symbol for the experience. It's not complicated. Yes, it's difficult and it takes time, but it is a decision to release. A decision to release them bringing healing to them. And paradoxically, as we know from the prayer of St. Francis and the Lord's Prayer, when we release them, we are released. That wasn't my intention when I started this work. I'm inviting you, and, and I checked with Fred to make sure that he was okay in his secular mode uh, with prayer. And he said, Herb, I've been meditating for 40 years. I have absolutely no problem with people's attempt to have more consciousness, which is prayer. Prayer is not words. Prayer is about intention. Prayer is about intentional consciousness. We can put it into words spoken. We can put it into words unspoken. And we don't even need words because prayer is an intention and an attitude of openness to the life force, whatever that means to each one of us. Please join me. This is the prayer that whose intention is to have an attitude toward reality. I cannot control it. I, I threw away the word control 25 years ago. 
I realized I, I, I don't control anything outside of me or inside of me. I influence. And I have a responsibility to influence outside and inside. But I have very little influence even outside, a little more influence inside. And the development of wisdom comes from making mistakes over a long period of time and correcting them regularly, frequently. Wisdom normally is reserved for people who are a little bit older because younger people haven't made enough mistakes yet. Please join me. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. So ask yourself why you're here. Well, no, this is a workshop. Although we will be uh, talking and having a lot of discussion, and uh, Fred and I will have a little dialogue at the end of mine and then at the end of his, we will be inviting you to submit questions, not submit, but ask questions raised hands, et cetera, but probably we'll wait until the end of our time uh, uh, of discussing our relative experiences, each one of us, so that we make sure that we give you the content of both Fred's and my knowledge as well as our experience. And so make notes so that you don't forget the questions and or the observations and or your experience uh, that you might want to share to support what we're talking about, or basically to even challenge it. I'm all very okay with that. Why are you here? But I'd also like you to ask yourself, in your life, is there any person or circumstance that is unforgiven, unreleased? You just can't go there because of the horror of the abuse or the trauma or the event or the circumstance? Were you betrayed, threatened, interfered with, disappointed, abandoned, wounded, hurt, deeply, abused? Do you have regret and shame and guilt about the way you've handled your life? You can't forgive yourself. obviously, a complicated litany of response to our historic experiences. One of my teachers is Richard Rohr, and he said, ask the question in the milieu of prayer and hold the question asked but not answered and let it bubble. Let the energy of the unasked question in the milieu of asking for help guide you to an experience. Einstein said the consciousness that created the problem cannot be the consciousness that solves the problem. That's brilliant. I love pithy, succinct sayings like that. My mind that is my source of my problem cannot be the source of my solution until in fact my mind is healed and fixed. There needs to be a shift in consciousness. There needs to be some kind of change. Again, I'm asking you to pray out loud, pray quietly, or at least have the intention of having an open mind and heart. Oh, you have a lot of knowledge and you have a lot of experience. I have no doubt. Those are the kind of people that show up for events like this. And you may have some questions and you may have some answers. The man who took me through these steps that I mentioned earlier said, Herb, you have a lot of information, but you have no transformation. You have a lot of knowledge, but it's never filtered through your heart to your feet. You have not changed. And in fact, at age 48, with my background, which is not relevant right now, 
I thought I was a Renaissance man. And after I did that step work, I realized I was a Neanderthal. It was embarrassing, but it was also life-changing to experience that I didn't know that I didn't know and I couldn't see that I didn't see. And now I was beginning to know and see that. What a gift, what a grace. Please join me in this intention of having an open mind and an open heart. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself my unmanageability, the 12 steps, and you, for an open mind and a new experience with myself, my unmanageability, the 12 steps, and especially you. Forgiveness is a process. It doesn't happen by Tuesday. It'll happen at some point if, in fact, you apply your knowledge and your will and your action and you have some guidance from somebody who has some experience with the process i talk about 12-step spirituality and what i mean by spirituality is a relationship i don't mean a religious tradition at all it transcends religious traditions Religion is the tool to spirituality, or as the Buddhists say, it's the finger that points the way to the light. Unfortunately, it's human nature to begin to worship the finger and stay stuck in the tools. But the point of spirituality is a relationship with light, with consciousness, a relationship with power, those first three steps, a relationship with ourself, the next four steps, a relationship with others, the final two steps. And then the management of our life. We are empowered to manage our life with the conversion experience that we have as the result of the steps one through nine. Steps one through nine, a program of recovery. Steps 10 through 12, a program for living. The best kept secret in the world in the world of the 12 step fellowship. Unfortunately, it's been my exposure and my experience. The author of the big book, Bill Wilson, as he completes the step nine instructions, tells us the promises of finishing those nine steps and then suggests that we have entered the world of the spirit. We have entered the world of the spirit. We have come out of the world of selfishness and self-centeredness. But we're not cured. It's not a reference to our addiction. It's a reference to our unmanageability, that second half of the first step. And we have a daily reprieve. A daily reprieve. I mean, it's not a secret because it's there in black and white. And yet most people don't understand the unmanageability as the spiritual malady or translate into the secular language as the human problem. Selfishness, self-centeredness. My free will will always choose me on its unaided I have an addiction that brought me to the 12-step program, but I find that even after my addiction is taken care of and neutralized because of the work of the first nine steps, my life is unmanageable. Not a connection to addiction, but a connection to my humanity. My free will will always choose me, selfish and self-centered, and unless I grow through the what we call the rite of passage in normal psychology and sociology, the rite of passage from childhood to adulthood, which is interrupted for addicts, and we stay as children emotionally. Bill Wilson wrote the article in 1958 based on his experience, Emotional Sobriety, The Next Frontier. 
it stayed hidden until just recently, the last five or 10 years, people are becoming aware of what does emotional sobriety mean? This is what we're talking about. But is God necessary? Well, this is a picture from the Sistine Chapel representing Michelangelo, representing the finger of the creator reaching down metaphorically to create humans. God made humans in God's image and likeness. He made them male and female. I'm quoting from the first book of the Hebrew scripture, the Torah, Genesis. God made humans in God's image and likeness. God made them male and female. But notice there's a space there. That's the mystery for me. I don't know how it works. I speculate that it works because of my experience. There's a mystery here, though. We get to make that decision about power. In the 12-step program, it's totally all-inclusive. There are no rules. There are only suggestions. A suggestion is to have a spiritual awakening. A suggestion to have a life changing experience, radical change, coming from the Latin radix, root at the root level. And we need to find a power other than ourself, and we need to make that decision. <clears throat> That's the human component that makes us very noble, that gives us dignity, our ability to make a decision. To accept in the first step our complete defeat in addiction, certainly. And knowing that we need a, some type of power other than ourself. Dr. Alan Berger, who I do a lot of work with, as you know, in emotional sobriety, he calls it the organismic life force. What makes an acorn develop into an oak tree? It's a fabulous image. It makes it so concrete for us, still mysterious, but very concrete. There is something in the acorn to allow it, given the right circumstances, to become an oak tree, a process. We get to make that decision about power. You could ask yourself that question. What, what, what is or what was my decision about power? Now, here's the question that cracked me open in my agnosticism. I didn't know that I was a practical agnostic. I was 10 years in the fellowship, having had two prior spiritual awakenings. It was major transformative stuff. And yet, I didn't know that I didn't know that I was a practical agnostic. And I found that I... I found that out when he asked me about my decision, which was very clear. I was able to write a theological treatise that was pretty impressive. But then he asked me a second question. How do you behave in light of your theory? How do you behave? He said, your head and your heart will always lie to you. Your feet never will. You want a litmus test of who you are? You want a litmus test of your integrity? You want a litmus test of your principles? You want a litmus test of what you believe? Do an inventory of your feet. How do you behave? Yes, very confrontive. Yes, very disturbing. that organismic life force, reality flows. We have free will and most of us have exercised this certainly in our youth and in our immaturity, our self-will where we go against the life force. Look at my hands, Those, that's the illustration on the PowerPoint. We go against the life force. There's a life force, whatever that acorn, Becoming an oak tree, that organismic life force, whatever that reality is, that flow. And we make a decision to go against it, certainly with our addiction, but also with our self-will. And the whole point of the 12-step program is to turn. That's the commitment in step three, to turn. 
through the use of steps four through nine to turn and to be turned so that we're in alignment. That's my term for living life with serenity. I talked about that as relationship to the prayer. We don't need to use spiritual words here. We don't need to use psychological words here. We just need to be very practical. Are you in the flow or are you disturbed? One of the pieces of literature says it's a spiritual axiom. If you're disturbed, there's something wrong with you. Oh, but you have to meet my wife. You have to meet my bosses. You have to meet my parents, my mother and father. Then you would understand why I'm disturbed. Yeah, no, not really. Sure, they all contributed to the tension in your life, Herb. But it's your reaction that is the problem. People and circumstances are never the problem. To be in alignment is the goal. To be in alignment, a decision for a relationship with that power, with that organismic life force. Again, it's the decision. This is the magnificent of the human being. We have free will and we can make a choice. But what is it free in? Not addiction. That whole point of step one is that we're powerless. We have no choice. But the other part and the overlooked part is that our life is unmanageable on our own power. We're not fast enough. We're not tough enough. We're not smart enough. We're not knowledgeable enough. We're not effective enough on our own power. I need help at the very least from a mentor teacher support system at the very most from a power other than ourself with a capital P. Alignment is the goal. Alignment with reality. And I th I'm probably, Fred, I, he and I have not co-presented since 20 years ago, but I'm pretty confident he's going to talk about living in reality. Because forgiveness is about that. It's about living in reality. This is living in fantasy, living in addiction. Pathetic Herbie, in the bondage of addiction, not knowing that he didn't know, wondering why his life is deteriorating. But four years clear of the addiction, placed in neutrality by a grace that I can't explain, but I'm forever grateful for, I'm in the bondage of self, and I don't know that I don't know that until I do know that. And I'm embarrassed to acknowledge that I am not a Renaissance man, I'm a Neanderthal. Bill Wilson, the author of The Twelve Steps, says we have to participate in a process of ego deflation at depth. So we have to look at our story. Some of these are words that I learned from Fred. These are words that I learned from his book, Forgive for Good, that put words to my experience in doing the step process. I did the step process without awareness of the context. I needed to transcend the context and have the experience and then get some words from outside sources so that I could understand what I had just experienced. I have certain genetics. You might have noticed that I'm bald and white. It's not my fault. My father was bald and white and his father and his father. I'm also an alcoholic. I've admitted that. It's not my fault. My father and his father and his father. It's the genetics. And uh, I think science is pretty well documented that it's uh, addiction is 80, 90% genetic. But it now is my responsibility. I was raised in a particular culture which formed my attitudes. I was given some experiences in that culture in my neighborhood and in the schools I went to. Now you notice that these are the Russian dolls that are in gift shops that are 
encased one in another and they all look the same. These are the facades that we create to create safety for ourselves, to create a fit into the culture, fit into the community, fit into the tribe so that we will be safe and protected. And we don't know that we don't know that we have a Hollywood storefront that we've created over time. And we think our persona is our personality. Persona is a word from the Greek language. They had plays that they did 3,000 years ago in these wonderful stone auditoriums. I've been there to Greece and you can speak from the podium at the bottom of the tiered stadium and hear the words a hundred yards away at the top of the, of, the, of the stone benches. The acoustics were really good, but at that distance, you couldn't understand who the players were in the, in the, uh, in the play that was going on, who the actors were. So they carried these masks, these shields in front of them that represented the character in the play so that the people in the cheap seats could understand the motion of the play, the evolution of the play. Do you know what those shields were called? Persona. Yes, our personality developed from this mask that we wear. Today, the psychologists call it the false self, this process revealing the true self. What are the obstacles to awareness? The central root cause, Bill says, is selfishness, self-centeredness, which I introduced earlier as unmanageability, and the fruit of the root, resentment and fear, and sex, and dishonesty, and secrets, and guilt, and shame. Some of the words not in the textbook, but certainly relevant to today's understanding of human makeup. Our step four is to identify that and then to have those removed. In the process, and this is where forgiveness, this, this is the main ingredient for me, to understand forgiveness was to take a look at my beliefs in the column three resentment inventory, an extended version of what's in the big book. It's not there in detail and the application instructions are not there, but the men who helped me, my mentors, my teachers, my guides understand the words and their own personal experience with it so that I could get underneath, what is my belief about who I am? What is my belief about who others are? What is my belief about how life works? The word belief is not in the big book, but it certainly was the word that helped me unpack that I had a delusion about who I was. And if you are interested in further pursuit, take a look at the personality description, the nine characteristics of a narcissist. Shocking. My own therapist said the only thing missing from the DSM description, those nine characteristics, is your picture. Another additional arrow reducing that delusion that I was special and entitled and exempt and unique. And, and then to take a look at column four, the motives for my behavior. Now the word's not in the big book, but that is my word that captures my experience of an answer to these five questions. What am I thinking when I have this resentment? What am I doing when I have this resentment? What is the fear underneath it? What, where am I being dishonest? What is my responsibility? That final question that is the turnaround. Before I did this particular column, 
I believed I was a victim. Once I finished this column, I saw that I was the perpetrator. Completely turning from south to north, a 180 degree shift in my perception. Of course, we reveal the obstacles in step five. We name the character defects and see our powerlessness over them in step six. We pray for their removal in step seven. We name the harms that those character defects provide in step eight, and we make amends in step nine. Forgiveness as a process, a decision to release them. And paradoxically, I find that I am released. As I reviewed my experience, I saw that forgiveness was not to condone or forget or tolerate or ignore or approve or excuse or minimize. It wasn't my power to pardon and it wasn't my health to deny. I don't have the power to absolve. And there are kind times when I don't even wanna reconcile, but I do wanna release and be released from it. I do not wanna be hurt again. Surrender justice sounds very uh, noble and very vague. I had a man I was working with when he came to this area. He had the experience of his father molesting his two daughters, 12 and 14. And he confronted that. And he confronted his own anger about that. And he went through a process where he came to a place of forgiveness and love for his father. He maintains a good relationship with him today. But at that time, which was probably 25 years ago, he reported it to the police, had him arrested, had him convicted. And this man, his father, the grandfather of these children at age 67 was put in jail for six, prison for six years because he wasn't going to surrender justice. He forgave his father. He loved his father. He wanted a continued relationship with his father, but he didn't want to ever model to his daughters that what grandpa did was okay. It wasn't okay. And his father was never allowed in their house again or to see the daughters again until they were adults. That's what we mean by forgiveness, but not surrendering justice. Forgiveness is not a decision to retaliate or exact revenge or seek compensation or judge. It's a decision to release them and release ourselves and paradoxically, as I've indicated, be released. This ninth step was a very interesting process, which I believe is the step that brings us to the realization that we are in prison. We are imprisoned by our own attitude of unforgiveness and if we really want freedom, we have to realize that we're not in prison of their making. We're in prison of our making. Notice this cartoon, this second cartoon. There's no walls. There's no ceiling. There's no floor. There's just pathetic Herbie holding the bars in front of his face. He has to learn to drop the bars. Well, I had to admit to my boss of 20 years in an organization that I'd worked for that I'd been cheating on my expense account for those 20 years and wanting to make amends for that. I was willing to make payments to pay back a six-figure dishonesty. The interesting part of this process is that this man said to me, Herb, you probably were not paid as well as you should have, not recognized as much as you should have, you warranted. And uh, you've been a wonderful employee and contributed in many other ways. Let's uh, start fresh. And, and, and oh, by the way, uh, we bought a company car for you two weeks ago. 
um, that you you have. Um, why don't you give me a dollar and I'll give you the pink slip to it? I mean, how does that happen? I was there to pay back a six-figure dishonesty, and I get a five-figure car as the result. Yeah, I said yes, of course. You hear sometimes that we need to, we owe it to the universe. Well, I don't believe in that kind of fantasy recommendation. I deal with the person and I make the best arrangement that I can. I had a person who was attempting to get me fired. He was a colleague and a peer and he just didn't like me. I was four years sober. I thought I was restored because of my sobriety, but I didn't see and didn't appreciate the 17 years being there when I was drinking and being a real jerk. And that's a four letter word that's nice in contrast to the four letter words that most people were using about me. So he had a lot of intolerance and, and warranted anger towards my behavior. And he didn't want me to be promoted to the job that would run the Los Angeles office I was being considered. He wasn't being considered. He didn't want the job, but he didn't want me to have the job. I addressed that with him. I made amends to him for the stress that I put him under, for the time that I wasted. Explaining if he wanted to some aspects of my behavior. And he, he asked me the question, is this some kind of an amends process? I know you're uh, an alcoholic and uh, is this, and I said, yes, that's what I'm doing. And he said, well, he said, I, you're, you're a better man than me. You've got a lot of courage to sit down and face me with all of this. He said, uh, you're a real jerk. I don't like you. I never liked you. And if I had to do it over again, I would absolutely do it over again. And I'm sitting there and I just smile. And I say, thank you, Bob. And but now when I see him, if I ever see him, and I did for a while until I retired in uh, uh, public events, professional events, there was no tension in me. There was a tension in him, but there was no tension in me because I had released him. And in releasing him, I had been released. How about people I couldn't find? Or I shouldn't find? Some people tell us that there, there's, we're never going to finish our amends. It's, for me, that's a lie. I have finished my amends all four times I've done the step work over a 20-year period, four different times. We need to be creative, and, and I choose a spiritual approach to the people I shouldn't find or I can't find. And I designate a period of prayer for them, for their healing. I make this stuff up. It's not in the big book. It's not even sometimes my, my step guides or sponsors experience. But I, in prayer, get guidance as to how to get free. And I pray for three days or I pray for three weeks or I pray for three months, depending on the substance of the offense. And when I'm through with that predetermined ritual, I'm done and I'm free and I don't have guilt and I don't have shame that hovers over me inappropriately. What about a dead person like my father? I had a rage toward my father, which I had worked on in therapy and etc. all of the human development stuff of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And I'm here in the 12-step program four years, and I still have this rage. And he's dead. 12 years, he's been dead. It was recommended that I go to a cemetery, any cemetery. He had been cremated. There was no burial plot. And sit there and write a letter as if he were there. Invite his presence as if he could come and write a letter in his presence and then read it out loud. 
took me a couple hours. It was very emotional. I used a half a box of Kleenex. I mean, it was soul rending experience. And I walked out free. I had released him and he had released me. At the end of that process, I said to him as if he were there, what can I do in addition to repair this damage? And it was very clear, this voice in me said, take care of your mother. I walked out, my mother had disappeared two years earlier. Sold her house, sold all of her belongings, moved out of state with no forwarding address because she was so angry with me over some financial uh, uh, arrangements that we had made. A substantial uh, deposit on a house. She said it was a gift and I said that she said it was a gift and she said years later that it was a loan because of the program I had written a check and, and satisfied it, but we, she was still ang angry enough that she left. I didn't know where she was, so I went to the union that sent her a check because of my father's Teamsters commitment. I said, I don't know. I don't want to know where she is, but send this letter with the next monthly uh, pension check. In that letter to her, I said, if there's anything else I can do, <clears throat> let me know. And I sent pictures of the children. She was a great grandmother, loved my children and my wife probably more than me. Two weeks later, I got the envelope back. It had been opened, it had been read. But she was still so angry, she returned the pictures of the kids. Yeah. Two years later, we're talking about four to six years now as a distance. I get a phone call. Herb, you wrote me a letter two years ago, and you said if there's anything that you can do for me, or is that offer still open? And I said, well, of course, mom, by the way, hi, how are you? And uh, she said, I've got terminal cancer. I've got six months to live. I want to come home and take care of things. We brought her home. She lived in our house until we couldn't take care of her any longer. We visited her every day in the hospice environment and she died free. And we got free because of a process of forgiveness that I was taught in the rooms and by other people and their experience. It's really important to get experienced advice. It's the most important and sacred part of this journey. This man who took me through the steps and was giving me his experience and guiding me through the roadmap of step eight, a list of harms that I had done, we, I came to one that was with a woman 25 years earlier, and he said, I have no experience with that. You need to go to a woman who you trust in the program and ask her after 25 years, would she want it resurrected and talked about? And if she would, how would she recommend you approach it? And I did just that. And she said, yes, I would. And here's the process. And in the process of talking to the woman from 25 years ago that I had offended, this woman said to me, I'm so glad that you called. This has been so healing. I had not used that word, but that was her experience of the process because I had made a decision to confront my behavior to have a discussion with the person who I had hurt with a willingness to attempt to repair that damage and to bring healing to her. And I got free and she got free. What about a wife who had been hurt and betrayed for years, if not decades, by my behavior? She was at 25 years married, 
so intimidated by me, so hurt by me that when I would approach her or she would approach me, she would stutter. She wasn't a stutterer, but that was the level of tension in our home. And we were talking about divorce. And I said, I don't know whether to come or to go. And she said, I don't know whether to come or to go. She had her own program and her own sponsor and her own spiritual life. And at the recommendation of my own sponsor, Step Guy, I asked her if she would pray with me. And she said she would for guidance and for healing. We got on our knees, not to get God's attention, but to get our own attention, an act of submission, an act of humility. We needed help. And we held hands and we looked in each other's eyes the first morning I prayed out loud for guidance and healing. The next morning she prayed out loud for guidance and healing. And within a week, we, in our discussion, noticed that the heat had gone down between us. We continued that practice for three years. When she died three years ago, we had 52 years of marriage. The last half of those 52 years was a wonderful intimate friendship. How do you get here from there? How do you get here from there? All of those, and, and so many more stories. Through a process, through a process of accepting responsibility, of identifying the beliefs that are the lies, that are identifying the motives that are corrupt, by identifying the fantasy that I'm a victim and the truth that I'm the perpetrator, I'm 100% responsible for my life. I don't have a part in my anger. I don't have a part in my resentment. I have 100%. I own it. The life I have today is exactly the life that I built. The life that you have today, right now, right now as you're sitting here listening to me, the life you have is exactly the life that you built. By your thoughts and by your feelings and mostly by your actions. And the good news is, that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that we can change it. We can have a life that flourishes. That's the use of the term from positive psychology. A life that flourishes. If we take responsibility, if we get some information, if we get some help, and if we take actions based on principles. I hear the comment about living amends, and sometimes it's a dodge for making real amends. Oh, I'm just going to live differently and the universe will heal. Eh, nice try. A little new agey for me. If living amends, you mean living differently. If living amends means that you're conscious of becoming a nice person and or contributing to somebody else's having a nice life, then I'm okay for that. But it's not a substitute for the actual detailed amends to any person or institution. I'm going to stop there. The bottom line is that I, I, I've adopted an attitude as a result of this process of being undefended. I have released them. I have been released. And now I can live free. The purpose of this is the healing that comes about. The purpose of this forgiveness process is freedom. My freedom and their freedom. I'm going to stop the video and go to Fred now. So Fred, if you if we want to take a, a, a little break now, it might be a good time for people um, or uh, you can make your comments now and we can break in a minute uh, after uh, your comments and or um, after your presentation. How would you like to do it? Well, hello, everyone. Let me talk for about two minutes, and then you should move. Um, 
there's pretty good evidence that if you sit in front of a computer for more than an hour, your brain starts to turn to mush anyway. So, and if some of you started with mush, it, this is not, it's not a good add on to, to what we have. Um, I'm going to, I just want to articulate two um, points that Herb made. And I, I make them differently, but but they're exactly the same. Is um, we're too self centered, and and we view the world way too much through our own needs and our own desires and our own like woundedness. So we don't see the world clearly. We don't see anything clearly. And um, the two things that I would add to that, that that her probably wouldn't talk about is that there's a, a recent study that looked at people's perception of other people for accuracy and, and found through some um, functional MRI scanning that if you didn't have um, at least some degree of compassion towards other people, you were simply misperceiving them. That it's only with some shared perspective, compassion, I relate to you, empathy, I can, I can feel what you're feeling. Our self-absorption dominates reality. And when we bring compassion in, what it does, it doesn't change them, it changes us. So we no longer see their worst faults. We no longer see them as an enemy. We simply see them as literally another bozo on the bus. You know, all of us trying to figure out what the hell we're doing here. So that's one, the, the self-absorption. The second piece is the responsibility piece. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you some stories, but you can know that I have worked with people from all over the world who have experienced some pretty awful things. And I've worked with people from all over the world who have experienced some pretty trivial things, but you'd think that they had experienced some pretty serious things, you know, that they rattled big storms in their teacup. Um, but the way the brain works is when painful things happen, difficult things, losses, changes, we need time to um, recalibrate and rebalance. And that's called grief. And that's legit. And it's necessary at, during grief to be angry sometimes and to be sad and to be scared and to be pissed and to be frustrated and to hide under your bed covers for a while. I mean, that's like perfectly healthy stuff. And the purpose is for your brain to integrate what happened. So that once it reintegrates, it, it's rebalanced and it moves ahead with new information. So if your partner lied to you, you have to include new information that Partners lie. People don't always do what I want them to. I may have to deal with stuff that I don't want to deal with. That's what grief is for. When grief doesn't occur in a healthy way, or we stop it because we don't want to accept that our husband or wife did what we didn't want, we damn the system up. We screw up our nervous system. We screw up our cardiovascular system. We screw up our brain because we don't want to take responsibility for moving our life ahead. Mm -hmm. and, and these are real obstacles to what I might call a life well lived. Mm -hmm. You know, this self-absorption, and this unwillingness to simply say, like, you know, whatever's happened to me, I still guide the ship. And, you know, even if the ship runs aground, it's my responsibility to take it back to sea if I want to. 
I can't sit there and scream at the iceberg for the rest of my life. I mean, I can, but it ain't too sharp a way to deal with things. <laughs> so these are shared concepts. And I'm going to say, these are the kind of concepts that are at the heart of mental health. So, I mean, from my point of view, it doesn't matter whether you do it from a 12-step program or a, a belief in, in Jesus or prayer to Buddha or, you know, simply going to a therapist and talk it through. The, the central way that your nervous system processes your life has multiple possible inputs. And I will reiterate what Herb said. Um, it's easier if you believe in a benign higher power. It is easier. The downside is it's harder if you believe in a punitive higher power. Yeah, right. There's research on this, that people who believe in a punishing God do worse in life. People who believe in a benign, helpful God, they do better in life because, in part because they give some of their um, ego over to that higher power so they're not carrying as much of an ego burden. That's one absolute reason. But two, they, because of the benign universe or God or spirit, they recognize that in a safe world, they are free to change. Mm. In a critical, harsh world, they're not free to change because they have to protect themselves all the time. But you can't do forgiveness without freedom to change. And you can't do most of what's good in life without freedom to change. Because that little ego hunkering down to protect you will cling for dear life. But those people who believe there's something bigger than that, they have a, a, a like a entry point where they can let go of some of that fear and trust a little bit. Anyway, please take a break. Um, no, I mean, you're not going to get much out of this if you're just staring at a screen indefinitely. Why don't you say like seven, eight minutes, and then we'll start again. But I'm going to tell you, don't check your email. Get up and move or get take a drink. You need a break from the screen. Right. And take five minutes. It might end up be seven or eight minutes, but target five. I know who you are. Target five, and we'll get back here and start again in about seven or eight. Thanks very much, Fred.
Fred, you're you're back, and when you're ready, you can uh, begin talking to us. Well, hi again, everyone. Um, you know, <laughs> I was contacted by her a bit of, at a um, opportune time. I, I told him this. Um, we're just starting a little bit of research on um, like our method of forgiveness uh, for people in recovery. Um, we have, if we want to, and I'm not sure that I want to write another book, but we have, we have a book offer from New Harbinger to write a forgiveness like book for people in recovery programs. Um, and, and I want to make really clear what, when I, when I say secular, um, like I myself have, I, I, I told, I, I said, I've, I've been meditating since high school or actually college practicing yoga since high school. And, you know, deeply believe that, that there's something extraordinarily mysterious and way beyond my pay grade to understand about how this world functions. Um, but I wanted to create a program that we could take anywhere. I mean, that, that was the purpose of a, of, of a, of a secular program. We, I've given, you know, forgiveness talks, grand rounds in hospitals and um, to lawyers and Supreme Court thing, not, not the, you know, the California Supreme Court and um, to churches all over the place who wanted a methodology that would complement or be acceptable in places where you don't want to talk about a higher power. So what I tried to do and what we tried to do when we created the Forgiveness Project was look at what were the key elements of forgiveness, like irregardless of how you got there. So we spoke to all sorts of folks and we worked with all sorts of folks. We didn't care how you came to us. I will tell you something interesting though. Um, we did one research project a few years ago at a um, Christian college in the Midwest. Um, they did a comparison study of our forgiveness methodology and a, a, a Christian forgiveness methodology. They did a randomized trial of students attending a, a Christian university. And um, there were no differences in outcome. <laughs> like both worked, yeah. you know, because, well, the biggest thing is um, intention, as Herb said, matters more than anything. Like um, that famous statement, if you like, if you have a how, you know, or if you have a why, you'll find a how. That's really important. So I, I offer no arguments. I mean, not none, but, you know, kindness, goodwill, um, forgiveness, generosity. Um, I don't personally care where it comes from. And <laughs> as I've said many times and semi-joking, because I really have no idea, I don't think God cares either. You know, if, if if you treat people well and are like somewhat humble and good hearted, I, I, I don't sense it, you know, that anybody up there is keeping score as to how you get there. Um, but but the point is that there are real practical ways to um, become a more forgiving person. There really are. There were research tested maze, ways. One of them is a, you know, I don't know if you would call it a 
secular or a spiritual method, but from the secular point of view, it's called self-regulation. From a more religious sense, it's prayer, meditation, um, opening to presence. The point of the practices is it quiets you down. And from a brain point of view, or a nervous system point of view, if you're all agitated and angry, you don't think straight. I mean, it's just that simple. You're actually stupid when you're angry. <laughs> really? You, 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 I mean, I don't remember the exact thing, but you lose IQ points <laughs> when you're pissed off. Not that if you've had a partner who's pissed off and you see them, you know they've just had an IQectomy. I mean, you can see it when they're, you know, when they're just pissed, you know they're stupid. The bad news is they know the same about you, yeah. right? They see you angry and they go stupid inside of their households, but they also go scary. And so your anger lowers other people's anger of IQ, as well as lowering your IQ, because you scare people. Mm -hmm. And when we're scared, we're stupid. But so what we figured out you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, was people who are not forgiving, is calm down. Really, calm down. Relax. <laughs> Make peace. We teach it through simple meditation practices. So I'm going to ask you all to join with me in a very modest um, guided imagery meditation practice. I mean, I do teach meditation classes at Stanford, but they are secular meditation classes. So we do a survey of meditation practices, not, not supporting one faith practice, but all sorts of different kinds. And we teach graduate and undergraduate students to meditate. So what I'd like you all to do is join me, but, but I'm going to have to give you, um, like I need you to do so in a non-distracted way. Because our addiction to technology, I mean, maybe it's not as serious outward facing as addiction to drugs and alcohol, but inward facing, it's a pretty serious addiction because we really have a hard time quieting ourselves down now. We do. So what I'm going to ask all of you out there is to put your phone away, your cell phone, Kiss it goodbye for a few minutes. <laughs> like, tell it you're sorry that you're no longer going to be its babysitter. Put it away. Because what you don't recognize is what a threat that phone is to your well-being and how often you are checking it, even when you don't recognize that you're checking it. So your brain, because your phone is a threat, is monitoring it for its threat value. Do I have a message telling me I owe the IRS $12,000? You know, is my kid in trouble? Um, did they not have what I ordered at the bakery? Whatever. You are always, when technology is available to you, you are always a little bit anxious. Always. When you are multitasking, you are more than just a little anxious. You are quite anxious. You may think you're pulling one over on the universe by getting two things done at the same time. You are, except you're not actually getting them done at the same time. You're shifting attention very rapidly and you're wearing out your capacity for attention and you're lowering your willpower. That we only have so much will and attention to offer and most of us fritter it away with multitasking all day. I'm, I'm just... 
this is science stuff. This is not just like me wagging a finger at you, even though I do want you to chill for a minute so you can relax. And you can do that if you're staring at your phone and you have seven windows open on your computer and you're listening to something on the TV and you're eating dinner. <laughs> You literally can't learn anything under those conditions. You just can't. So put your toys away. <laughs> close the windows on your computer you do not need. Just close them. Because you want to set the conditions to make it more likely that you'll actually touch the place in you that can find peace. Because I'm going to tell you, that's where forgiveness lives. It's inside of you. It's just you at peace. So please put the toys away and give yourself permission to simply pull back for a few moments. You have to give permission, otherwise you won't. You'll just close your eyes and think about the IRS. So I'd like you to pull back for a moment, close your eyes. And then literally remind yourself, literally remind yourself how lucky and safe you are as people in this world go. Like, Literally having affluence enough to have a home, having an internet connection, probably running water, food. What we're trying to do is create a space where we can be at peace for a few moments with our life. So you just want to tell yourself, you know, I really am okay to close my eyes and... Um, and chill. And when, when and if you give yourself permission, your body will start to relax. You don't, you don't really have to do that much except give yourself permission. And you want to encourage your body to relax by softening your shoulders. Like, it's very hard to be at peace with tight shoulders. And so if you can, like, soften them, relax them, even shake your arms a little. Just you want your shoulders because they're protecting the center of your body. You want to become vulnerable and safe. So you want your shoulders to relax. And you want your belly to relax so you can breathe. You literally want to relax your abdomen so you can breathe gently and deeply. And any meditation instruction reminds you that when you inhale, allow your stomach to expand, your belly to get bigger. 
allow your breathing to be unhindered so that when you inhale, the air pushes your abdomen out. And when you exhale, your abdomen contracts. And you really, really, really want to remind yourself you're safe enough to do this. That you're at least safe enough for a few minutes to relax your body and just to allow your breathing to be normal. Which is when you inhale, the air fills the space. When you exhale, the abdomen, the diaphragm pushes the air out. And with, if you keep your shoulders soft, you'll lower your blood pressure, you'll reduce your muscle contractions, And then one more moment of this, just bring an image to your mind of someone you really love. Just bring an image to your mind of someone you really love. And you want to try to feel the affection that you have for this individual. And you want to you want to almost feel it in the area around your own heart. And then you just want to let that go. Let the image go. Let the feeling go. And you just want to relax. Maybe take a breath and open your eyes gently. And, and the... 
You just want to sit for a moment without fidgeting. Because what, what I will say is, um, at least what we understood from the beginning of our work was forgiveness, compassion, generosity, kindness, tolerance, they're all latent inside us. Depending on what we practice, depending on our perception, they become more or less activated in us. But many of us are so distraught and so anxious that we don't quiet down enough to even recognize the possibility of really being at peace. Even for three minutes, like just being at peace. And so you have to practice, like you have to take moments out and practice a reminder, and this is this is its direct relationship to forgiveness. You can be at peace with your life. Like it's it's not that comp. I mean, it's as as Herb said all over the place. It's like simple, but not easy. But it is simple. Because unforgiveness is right now saying there's something in your experience, in your past or your present, that's such that you're not okay with your life, the whole picture of it. So it could be mom from 40 years ago, or it could be, you know, somebody else from two months ago, or it could be you from how you behaved, or it could be the conditions in the world. But what you're saying is this experience is such that I don't want to release it and be at peace with my life. So when you're unforgiving, you're saying in 2021, I don't want to be at peace. I just don't want it because I had a crappy mother or I had a crappy partner or I drank too much or I was an asshole, whatever it was. I don't want to be at peace now. That's what we're saying. And, and even maybe more dangerously, I want to punish people. Not only don't I want to be at peace, but I want to make sure the world's not at peace. Simply because an experience happened that I don't want to release. I don't want to let go of my negativity around that experience. So I'm going to make sure I'm not at peace. And neither will you be. Because I'm going to tell you how shitty things are. And then if you don't buy my vision of a shitty world, I will tell you that you're insensitive. You just don't get it. And we try to spread our unforgiveness wherever we go. We do. It's an active process. You know, I'm a, I was more than am a licensed um, psychologist. I don't do much therapy. I, um, <laughs> I don't know how to put this. What I decided was I had no del delight in sitting in a little room with unhappy people. Like I, I don't know any other way to put that. It just wasn't a great way of life. You know, I didn't want to be in small rooms <laughs> with like unhappy people coming in. I, I, I like teaching more than therapy. But I was trained as a therapist. 
And I remember once a couple came in. I, and I, it was a, a man and a woman. I do not remember who was talking. I think it was the woman. And the woman's talking. And the guy, like, interrupts her to say something. And she yells at him, saying, how dare you interrupt me? I've told you that's what my father did. And how dare you, like, not remember that I was badly treated by my father. And therefore, what's wrong with you? And she's going off. And I'm looking at her like she's crazy. And I'm thinking to myself, this is way before I knew much about forgiveness. I'm thinking, it's her fault she hasn't healed. How is that her husband's fault? It's her problem. And yet she's carrying it with her and throwing it at everybody who doesn't do what she wants. It was an amazing experience. And she felt justified. And I bet you she'd probably trot out her inner child to tell me how vulnerable and horrible it was treating her inner child. And I would say, but you're 45. But that's what unforgiveness does. It gives us permission to be nasty. Because we haven't healed and we don't take responsibility for our own healing. Had she said to him, like I would think any normal adult would say, honey, I'm so sorry that you still have to suffer over the fact that I haven't let go of my childhood. Done. It doesn't mean she's perfect. Doesn't mean she can't be a raving lunatic at times, but at least she's owning whose problem it is. And it's hers. And this had such an impact on me. That wait a second, and therapists were training people all over the place to do it, and inner child work, um, you know. When you blame, I'm just going to use that word blame, you are setting yourselves up for all sorts of health consequences. They have shown that blame has a linear relationship to um, all sorts of health outcomes. That the more you blame, the more illnesses you have of all kinds, it's a position of complete helplessness. It's not my responsibility. When you take responsibility, it doesn't mean that you know how to handle it. You just recognize where the problem is. So she can say, honey, I'm stuck. You know, I, I, I yell at you because, I'm, you know, whatever, whatever happened to me, I'm not clean with. But it's not your fault, and it may not even be my fault, but it's my responsibility. And that's, at the, at, that's when I recognize the desperate need for forgiveness. Because then you don't run around blaming anymore, including yourself. There's nothing wrong with saying, I had such difficult childhood experiences that I'm not clean from them. And I don't know when I'll be clean. And I don't even know how to be clean. But it's me. It's not you. And it may not even be dad anymore. It's just me. And when it's just me, then you can do some work on it. So fast forward a decade. I remember doing one of my first weekend seminars at Esalen. And there's like 30 people coming into the room and Esalen's on the Pacific coast and it's drop dead gorgeous. And I, 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 this was probably my first workshop there. 
And I walk in really nervous. And there's like 30 people already in the room. And I sit down hoping nobody will ask me to teach because there's just 30 people. I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, it literally. And so I make the mistake, and I'm being very clear with you. I made the mistake asking people, why are you here? Not one person told me the truth. 30 people said, I have a problem with mom. Um, I have a problem with dad because it was a forgiveness thing. Um, I had a terrible parent. I had a terrible past. This person did that. I screwed up. Everybody had a great story, but nobody told the truth. The simple truth was, I don't know how to cope with my life. That's the simple truth. I don't know how to cope with my life. My problem is not mom. My problem was mom. But the truth is, I don't know how to cope with my life today. I don't have the skills. That's what you get to if you're healthy and you forgive. It's like, I may need a lot of help, but it's about me. So you'll, you'll, you may laugh at this, I don't know, but about 80% of the people there, for whatever reason, had issues with mom. And half of them were issues with mom when they were young. About a quarter of them had issues with mom now. Like, boy, is she a terror. I can't stand her. And some of them even had issues with mom in the future. Like, we're going to have to put her in an old age home. And so she's going to be terrible. But I'm sitting there with all these people having issues with mom, past, present, and future. So that can't be mom's fault. Like, mom does, you know, like the temporal sequence means it's their processing. But here's what I came up with. And it's, it's you know, like a rule of thumb. If you had shitty parents, and some people had really shitty parents, as Herb said, forgiveness is not minimizing what happened or condoning bad behavior. It starts with telling the truth. It also finishes with a telling a different truth, but it starts with telling a truth. And because of forgiveness, then you learn to tell a different truth, one with compassion and goodwill, but the truth stays the same. I had crappy parents. The lack of truth is they are the reason why I can't cope now. The real truth is I had crappy parents and I never figured out how to straighten out my own life. And that's, that's the real truth. But I'm sitting there with all these people and I'm thinking to myself, okay, let's say you're 19 years old. You could blame 80% of your discomfort and dysfunction on your parents because you're young, you're still forming. Let's say you're 25, maybe you could then blame 60% on your parents. Maybe by 30, it's 45%. By 45, it's 20%. But the longer you live from an incident, the more your coping is responsible for your experience. And we don't honor that truth enough. And I, and I heard Herb talk deeply about how many ways people try to become victims and tell stories about how it's not their fault. Forgiveness says very clearly that really painful things have happened and things that from any moral sense are wrong. It also says that it's inside of me 
what I do with that truth. And that I have a choice as to how much bitterness and victimhood I hold. I have a choice. So forgiveness in no means suggests that it's okay that people abuse children. But it also suggests you're going to have a vastly inferior life if you spend 20 years trying to excuse your terrible relationship skills because only because you were abused as a child. That it is a non-skillful way to handle life suffering. The other point that Herb didn't make is, um, he showed it, but he didn't make it, that forgiveness does not mean you have to reconcile with an offender. I can't tell you how many people came to my classes and said, um, you know, I had a terrible, terrible, terrible childhood. And now I'm 25. I don't want to be burdened by it. So I want to heal but I don't want to go home over Thanksgiving. And I would say that sounds really smart to me on both counts. And let me make it tangible. There are many people who have bad marriages that reconcile and don't forgive. So they come home every day, they treat each other like shit but they're together, they reconcile, but they don't forgive. There are other marriages that don't reconcile, but forgive. And when they interact each other, forgive with great kindness, act with great kindness. We couldn't make it work together. So we split. May they be happier with someone else, or I'm very happy that they're not with me, but go in peace. So their forgiveness and reconciliation are different. Forgiveness has some impact on reconciliation because when you forgive, your mind is not clouded with all your anger and resentment. So you see the person more clearly and you're more likely to take some responsibility for how you behave in the situation. So it may be more likely that you will forgive, but it doesn't necessitate reconciliation. It frees your own mind and heart so you can move on without, I'm gonna say prejudice. I'm gonna go on to something else, but I wanna just leave with one of, I heard says he likes these short statements. Desmond Tutu's famous statement, Without forgiveness, there is no future. I met Desmond Tutu once. He was an extraordinary human being. He still is, but he's in his 90s. He, he was one of this world's most extraordinary people. And what he meant by without forgiveness, there is no future, is without forgiveness, you keep on living out your past. You don't have an actual future. You just have a past replaying itself. And so you are stuck. This is the, the freedom that when we let go of our identification as a victim, we have a certain kind of freedom. So, Besides the owning the responsibility, recognizing that you want to free yourself, definitionally, forgiveness occurs in the present, and it often has nothing to do with the past. You decide to free yourself and make peace now. The people who heal recognize that at some point they have become their own worst enemy. 
I'm just as sick and tired of myself as I am of my ex, is what people say. You know, but I don't like living in my head. I hated living with her head, but I don't like living with my head either. So therefore, I have to do something to separate us. And even though we may have been divorced for 10 years, we're not separated because I'm still tied in emotionally and blaming her for parts of my life. So I'm stuck. Two things we have found, two very simple things are kind of foundational for making forgiveness easier. And they're very simple, positive qualities. They're called compassion and gratitude. And these are the simplest ways that we have found to engender forgiveness. Forgiveness is complex. Compassion is easier. Gratitude is easier still. When you free up your nervous system, from its chronic negativity, you actually free your mind up to think differently. So when you're under threat and every time you identify yourself as a victim, also every time you hurry and every time you multitask, you are under threat, you're anxious, you're under stress. When you're under stress, you cannot think loving thoughts. When you're under stress, you can't have forgiving thoughts. Because you need to protect yourself. Unforgiveness is an unskillful way of keeping ourselves safe. It's not stupid. It's not bad. It's absolutely essential short term, as I talked about a half hour ago. Grief is essential. Part of grief can be victimhood. Part of grief can be bitterhood, bitterness. It's all the ways that your mind tries to solve the issue of how do I handle something that felt unhandleable. And you try out things. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief are an essential precursor to forgiveness. You don't go from devastated to forgiveness in a straight line. You want to be pissed off if your boundaries were violated. You just don't want to be pissed off two years later. You want to be helpless when you were trammeled upon. You just don't want to stay helpless and you don't want to create a story around that helplessness, which is a victim story. That's what you don't want. But there were times when you absolutely were helpless and those need to be acknowledged and grieved. The two places that gratitude and compassion are so helpful is they normalize it. They normalize our suffering while grievance stories make it seem unique to us. So I've seen people, literally, and it's it's embarrassing for us as human beings. I've had people in classes who are furious that like seven years ago, Somebody lied to them and maybe cost them a job. But today, they don't care that like 700 million people will go to bed without food. They don't care at all. But they think they're doing something valiant for the world by being pissed off at what happened seven years ago because it happened to them but they literally don't even blink an eyelash because there are people tortured today. There are people starving to death today. There is horror so far beyond and they don't care at all. 
So unforgiveness and grievance tends to bolster the ego, make it bigger, because it localizes suffering in the self. It's all about me, all about me. And let me tell you again how bad my childhood was or how bad my marriage was or how bad my job was or how bad my treatment was. Every single time we do that, we feel less and less safe. And so we require adrenaline to protect us. Parts of our brain shut down. And then we create a story about how helpless we are. And then when somebody says, why weren't you responsible? We trot out our story. Here's why. I wrote this story nine years ago. It's great. I can share it again and tell you why I don't have to be a full adult because I have my story. Compassion, though, reminds us that everybody suffers. Everybody's hurt. It is such an important precursor to forgiveness. It is one of the ways, and Herb was talking a little bit about needing to put a little bit of a damper on your ego, on your selfishness. The simple practice of compassion has been around for thousands of years, is central to Buddhism because it works on your ego. So what I'm gonna do is a very simple um, meditation practice taken from Buddhist loving kindness practice, which is just metta. Let's wish everybody well. It's compassion practice. It's, you know, it's derived, the Stanford Sea Care taught it in the Dalai Lama inspired um, altruism and compassion center. Whatever you wish for yourself, wish for others. So we're going to do it as a short meditation. Again, these are secular practices, but they're derived from religious sources. If you would please just Again, pull back and be willing to close your eyes for a few moments. And please allow yourself to get comfortable. And, and in whatever way you can, relax your shoulders, please. Like, you know, move them around, pick them up. Like, really, relax your shoulders because then when your arms can re relax, your belly can breathe. And you want your belly to breathe as if you're safe. And so when you inhale, please expand your abdomen. The, the neurobiology of it is the only way your brain really knows you're safe is if your belly is relaxed and breathing deeply. Other than that, you are considered in threat. Because you, the, the body needs a simple biological mechanism. Simple and biological. So you want to inhale, expand your belly. Exhale, contract your belly, slowly and gently, 
and and really emphasize the gentle quality because you're practicing being safe. Practicing being at peace. Just like when you're angry, you're practicing being not at peace. And you want to practice being at peace. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to say, while you're just breathing and quieting down, I'm going to say the simple phrases of metta practice, which are to wish well for me and wish well for others. When I say it, all I want you to do is repeat it. Again, you're, it's a meditation you just want to whisper what I say out loud. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, may I be happy. I'm going to say it one more time, and you just whisper it in response. May I be happy. May everyone be happy. May those I love and cherish, may they be happy. May those I have yet to meet, may they be happy. And now I say it out loud and you just repeat it silently in your head. May I be happy. May everyone be happy. May those I love and cherish, may they be happy. May those I have yet to meet, may they be happy. And now we're gonna do one further practice. I want you to bring your attention to the area around your heart. And just the same practice, but almost from your heart. May I be happy. May everyone be happy. May those I love and cherish, may they be happy. May those I have yet to meet, may they be happy. And now we're just going to add one more simple piece. May anyone that has hurt me, intentionally or unintentionally, may they be happy. And you want to say that from your heart. May anyone that has hurt me, intentionally or unintentionally, may they be happy. And now, may anyone I have hurt intentionally or unintentionally, may they be happy. May anyone I have hurt intentionally or unintentionally, may they be happy. May everyone be happy. And so you just want to sit for a moment. That was just a four-minute practice. But you just want to sit and just repeat to yourself, may I be happy. May I be at peace. May I be safe. May everyone be happy. May everyone be at peace. May everyone be safe. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be at peace. May everyone be happy. 
May everyone be safe. May everyone be at peace. And then maybe one more breath in and out and very gently allow your eyes to open. So we can can shift ourselves from threat to a little more compassion. we can recognize that what we want, others want. I want to be happy, they want to be happy. I want peace, they want peace. I'm often unskillful at how I try to be happy, so are others. I often fail in making myself happy, so do others. But the purpose is to try to be at peace, not just to keep on practicing agitation. So when I said um, I made the mistake 20 something years ago at Esalen, by asking everybody, what are they doing here? And asking them to again, tell me how bad their life was. I wasn't helping them with that. They already knew how bad their life was. So more practice in telling it was not gonna improve their experience. That's only if you're teaching forgiveness. If you're a therapist, you want to know what they're dealing with. But if you're learning forgiveness, you don't need to, again, remind yourself of what it is that I can't forgive. You need to remind yourself of different things. Like, I want to be happy. Is my grievance helping me be happy? Usually not. I want to be at peace. Is it helping me be at peace? Usually not. Does it make me feel safe? Almost never. The other compassion practices are simple too. Anything that has happened to you is common, is a compassion truth. There's nothing new on earth. There's nothing unique you've experienced, nothing. Nothing at all. At the same moment that you're being harmed, millions of people on the planet are being harmed in the exact same way. Part of healing is to recognize you share a lot of things with other human beings including suffering. It's not just about you, as Herb said. In fact, none of it's about you almost in this world. I mean, you're not that important. There's a, I, I, I've been teaching a long time and I remember I would, you know, I try to tell her what I say So I'm trying to focus on some of the things that that were said before to to align them. But I remember telling a group of people um, that, you know, one of the key lessons of forgiveness is you're not the center of the universe. Like rarely do people try to hurt you to hurt you. 
Most of the time they hurt you because they don't give a shit about you. Or they don't even see you. Or you don't matter squat. But they're not trying to hurt you. That's rare. But we exaggerate our self-importance so our story always puts ourselves at the center of it when the person intending us had you as a nothing burger. But I remember just this wonderful, so I said, you know, you're not the center of the universe. And some guy raises his hand and says, can I tell you a joke? And that's one of the few things I'll let myself be interrupted for is for jokes because they're wonderful. I never let myself be interrupted anymore for people to tell me how bad their life is. That I do not allow myself to be interrupted for. So the guy said, let me tell you a joke. He said, scientists just located after decades of serious work where the center of the universe actually is. And there's going to be millions of people pissed because it's not them. And I thought, that's it. But compassion, please understand this. You have to have compassion for your predicament as a human being who is not the center of the universe, but fantasizes all the time that you are. That is a really difficult place to live in. It is really painful and hard. That you are not the center of anything except your own mind. But you fantasize all the time that you are, and those collide all the time. And that collision is very painful. So you want to help yourself by offering compassion to yourself because part of our suffering is our hallucination that we're at the center. And we need compassion for the vulnerability that suffering brings to us that reminds us we're not. When your partner cheats on you, when your parents abuse you, when your lover hits you, when a drunk driver smashes into your car, you're getting a reminder that you're not the center of anything. And it is really hard to hold. And a lot of times we stay pissed just so we don't have to see the truth. And so we want to bring compassion to this. The fact that these difficult experiences, they're showing us the truth and we don't want to see the truth. It hurts. So we need to bring compassion to this. That all of our wounds and injuries they're truthful reminders that we're vulnerable in life and that we're not the center of the universe. And that often those truths trigger us to react very badly. And the choice is, from my thinking, is we grieve or we become bitter. That's our choice. The grieving leads to forgiveness. The bitterness doesn't lead anywhere. Bitterness is a part of grieving. But here's the data. If you've been hurt badly, and even by normal life events like a hurricane or bad things, if your predominant emotion six months later is still anger, 
you're not going to do well moving ahead. Anger is designed as a short-term reminder to take care of business, to protect yourself, to protect others, to fix things. You know, if your house blows up, burns down, be angry, but rebuild your house. Don't just stay angry. Anger is meant as a short-term spur to behavior that makes you take care of business. The, the researchers distinguish it between constructive and destructive anger. Constructive anger is temporal. It's like in time. I know I hate what my brother-in-law said, so I got to do something about it. I hate, so my friend just had his car broken into, so he's angry, legitimately so. If two months from now, he's still angry because somebody broke into his car, that's his psychology. That has nothing to do with the car. If somebody cuts you off on the freeway and you give them the finger for 10 seconds, that ain't crazy. If an hour later, you're still telling everybody about the assholes on the road, that's your psychology, not the driver. So anger that's constructive either gets the emotion out quickly, says no, puts a barrier up, fights to protect something important. So if somebody's harming a child, Get angry. Help the child. Destructive anger is about the past and doesn't contribute much to any good coming from it. That's what happens when you're bitter. And when you're bitter, you have less trust. So more things make you angry. I'm going to say a few more things, give you another practice and then I'm going to stop so Herb and I can take some questions because I, I, I'm going to leave at one o'clock. Um, the forgiveness piece is forgiveness starts because something happened that was wrong. It's, it's an acknowledgement that something wrong happened. That's what you're not condoning or excusing behavior. After some time of grief, you're choosing a skillful response to what happened. When you don't forgive, you're again trying to give yourself an excuse for not moving forward. I've had people almost tell me, they won't put it this way, but I have. You know, my life's okay. It's like a seven on a scale of 10. But if I didn't have those crappy parents, it would be an eight. And I look at them and say, you're 43 years old. Why are you sacrificing a life point for parents? Why would you do that? I don't care if they were a till of the hun, they're not worth it. Forgiveness takes away our excuses for ruining our life and for ruining other people's lives. That's what it does. That's why it's at the heart of all the religious traditions, because they don't want you to ruin your life and more importantly, don't want you ruining anybody else's life. The, the religious traditions are all based on the golden rule. You know, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. They're all based on that. Every legitimate wisdom and practice and religion is based on the golden rule. Don't treat others badly if you don't want to be treated badly. Or treat them kindly if you want to be treated kindly. That's the heart of religion. Forgiveness takes away the big excuse we have to be nasty. 
well, people treated me badly. Or not only didn't I start at second base, I never got out of the dugout. Like my past was so bad, I never got out of the dugout. So therefore, I have been excused to be bitter my whole life. Forgiveness takes that away. And that's why it's at the heart of religious practices. Because it takes away our excuse to pay unkindness forward. And that's what we do with unkindness. We pay it forward if we don't release it. And so when you look at it that way, we all realize how we're in part creating the horror of this world. We're all part of it. Because we're all paying our suffering forward rather than forgiving it. And, you know, the, the, bi the biological thing is that both revenge and forgiveness are hardwired. They're not, they're, they're latent in our system. We choose which we want. The bad news is that the negative emotions are wired closer to the surface because we have to protect, protect ourselves from threat. So that's our biology. We have more access to negative emotion than positive. That's why when you're multitasking, your body's in danger because it knows that you're limiting your happiness by multitasking. And the only reason you're multitasking is you don't feel safe enough to just do one thing at a time. There's nothing wrong with multitasking but it's a sign of a lack of safety. So in multitasking, you're gonna be more likely to take offense. If you're sitting looking out the window and noticing how beautiful it is, you're less likely to take offense because you're calm and you're focused on a positive emotion. But positive emotions are harder. Let me give you one more meditation and then I'm going to stop. So there'll be like 20 minutes to ask me questions, whatever you want, or Herb and I. Again, one more moment, please, of quiet yourself. Please close your eyes. And since you've done the drill twice already, it will be easier this time to just sit still and really relax your shoulders and your belly. With practice, it gets easier and easier and easier. And almost Almost remind yourself how lucky you are to be able to sit still and close your eyes or relax your belly, that you're that safe. Remind yourself of that blessing. Because it is a blessing. To just try to be quiet and safe for a moment. And then once again, bring an image to your mind of someone you love. And bring a crisp, loving image to your mind. Make the person you love delicious so that you can feel the affection in your body.
And then I want you to just ask yourself one question. Now that my heart is a little open, what's a small grudge that I can simply release that I just don't need anymore, that now my heart's big enough to just let it go? It's absolutely not needed. Probably the easiest to pick someone you care for and that you're holding a grudge towards them just is not needed at all. But let it go. Just let it go into that openness and space of kindness and just let it go. And then take a breath, gently allow your eyes to open. So what I will say is I gave you a piece of what we teach, you know, like, a, I think I, what did I talk for an hour and 10 or 15 minutes, something like that, hour and 20 minutes. But I, I wanted you to get a sense of a, a secular uh, method that's based on um, physiology, um, neuroscience, as well as wisdom traditions of the world. You know, that... Um, And, and, and there's more to what we offer. I mean, I could do multiple segments like this, but I just wanted you to get a sense of that there is a, like a, a physiological state of quiet that you have access to nicer parts of yourself that are completely missing when you're telling yourself how bad things are or how unfair people have been or what a victim you are or any of the ways that we cement our roles, we are accessing a part of ourselves that is like limited to stress responses. When you clean that out, then you have a chance both physically and mentally to enter into a place where forgiveness might exist. So that's that's the central like learning that I wanted to um, share with you. And, and I tried to do it with a couple of simple practices. So it wasn't just conceptual, but you can see how um, it impacts like the way you could hold experiences. So anyway, I thank you for your attention. Um, if you want questions, I, I'm happy. If you put some questions in the chat box and maybe Herb and I can have a short conversation. But if you put questions in that chat box, I will do my best to answer them unless I don't know anything about the answer. But if I do know something about the answer, I'll do my best to share it with you. Um, but please put questions in the chat. So That's Herb, any, any thoughts? Well, thanks, Fred. Oh, my goodness. I've got five pages of thoughts, but uh, it, it, that's uh, probably an agenda for a, another time. As we've discussed, we will be together again. Um, I, I really so appreciate it. And quite frankly, I'm saying this, I believe it's true. If I had introduced you as a 12-step person, everything you said would not have conflicted with a 12-step Of course. <laughs>
<laughs> so yeah, exactly. One of my uh, participants in my workshop said one time, Herb, 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 I've had a epiphany. I said, what was that, Jason? He said, don't take reality personally. <laughs> <laughs> So it's wonderful. I, I think what I'd like to do, given your limitation with regard to time, you're, you're in charge till one o'clock. Yeah, I'll, let me take a couple. One of them is um, a question on unenforceable rules. And I could give you a very short answer to that, but I, I'd make a further suggestion that just at some point, Herb invites me back and I could do a whole segment on how cognitive approaches um, are, are very useful in leading to forgiveness and compassion because it's, a, it's more than just a, like a 12-second answer. <laughs> but I will give you a 12-second, maybe not a 12-second answer, but a little longer answer. We, we came up with a very simple thing that we called unenforceable rules. And it's expectations and demands that we have on anything that we don't control. So when we say, when we make a rule, you know, I have to have good service in a restaurant, you know, we don't control the server. When we say you have to be home on time, we don't control traffic. When it gets more dicey like that, like, you know, if you're with somebody who's drinking too much and you tell them you can't drink, you don't have any control over whether they drink. When you argue with the past, like, that's not how the past should have been. Those are all, every inch of that is a rule that we're trying to impose because we hate the vulnerability of knowing that shit can happen that we can't change. So we try to make rules up to make ourselves feel more powerful. They serve us well psychologically because they make us feel safer. The downside is when life violates them, we feel less safe because one of our rules was broken and therefore we now feel way more vulnerable in life than if we had better rules. But when we go through our day-to-day -day life, they allow us to like make believe everything's fine and cool. And, um, you know, and so we talk about, we talk about the challenging of these unenforceable rules as being essential to our well-being and our forgiveness. And again, I, I think it would be better if I simply spent another hour or so with you at a different time and taught that. There's a couple of other things that I could do in this that would really give you a deep grounding in how forgiveness is handled. But that's my answer about unenforceable rules. And uh, Fred, uh, I want to do a commercial for you. I've done it before for most of the people, but your book, Forgive for Good, I have said, and I have an extensive background, um, uh, is the second best book I've ever read, ever <laughs> read. No, no, I'm serious. A hundred percent. The first, the best book I've ever read is my big book, The Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> because it was a specific methodology of course, of for course. finding what I was looking for. But yours, yours put a lot of flesh on the skeleton. So I really, if people haven't read that book, they need to read that book. So go on I, with your- I agree with that. And if you do- ask me back, it would probably be useful for everybody to read the book between now and then. And I could really give you advice on it. Let me take another question. Yeah, please. What can I do when I'm on the receiving end of somebody else's anger over something that triggered their past anger over something else? Well, that's a great question. 
That's a tough question because there's two parts to it. One is you might have done something that's not kosher. <laughs> so for that, you want to apologize. Like, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I said something that hurt you. There are only a couple things that make forgiveness more likely, and a true apology is one of them. Now, let's say that you're 10 minutes late and somebody goes into a rage. So you can apologize for being 10 minutes late, but you can also tell them the rage is not on me. I'm 10 minutes late. I'm sorry for that. Like, I could see how that could be frustrating to you or, you know, or maybe it could make you feel like I don't care. That's a legitimate apology. Being in a rage over 10 minutes means they don't have self-control and there's something about their own psychology that has nothing to do with you. So there's two parts. There's what part is legitimately yours and what part is legitimately theirs. They're often not the same. That's one answer. Okay. Is there a way to practice compassion? I mean, that's such a broad question. Let me, let me take it in, in, in framework of forgiveness. One of the things you want to do if you're stuck with forgiving something is find other people who have suffered the way you have. Because you don't want to suffer alone. And you also want to recognize the humanity of the offense, not just the personal piece of it. When you're with other people, again, this is the yin and yang of it. Often when people get together because they have similar sufferings, they reinforce each other's victimhood. <laughs> Carol and Mace did wonderful work on this back in the 80s with her wonderful expression of woundology. Oh, look, you were mistreated the way I was mistreated. Let's bond on that and make it the central point of our relationship. That's not, that's good short term, terrible long term. Yeah. But when you find people who have similar wounds, you can practice internally and externally compassion. Look how we've been hurt. Life is difficult. It's not easy dealing with X. Many of us were not raised with good skills to handle things. These are all deep compassion statements. But it's us, not just me. That once you see what has harmed you is not common, is, is common, you've already pulled yourself a bit out of the ego pit. That this is terrible because it happened only to me or the group of people that I care about. We have tribal lack of compassion as well as tribal compassion. So you want to practice when you can making your suffering a little more universal. Okay. Somebody asked me about my contact in info. Um, after 25 years, I don't do that much of this. Um, I've known her forever, so he invited me. And of course, I'm going to do this and I'm happy to come back because um, I do some trainings. And I'm going to tell you truthfully, and this will sound both truthful and funny. I have two, mo well, three motivations now to do trainings. One, if I'm well paid. So if somebody offers me a lot of money, I say yes. If somebody offers me a modest amount of money, but I like them, I say yes. 
Or if somebody offers me sometimes no money, but the audience is totally deserving, I say yes. Separate from that, I don't do that much teaching anymore. I don't just show up and teach. But if anybody has an audience that they want me to speak in front of, and one of those three qualities apply, you're welcome to email me and talk to me about that. My email is fredl at stanford.edu. So that's my answer to that. Um, Do you have a website? Yeah, there's not that much on the website anymore. I, I stopped soliciting for business, but the website is learningtoforgive.com. But probably a better place to find out about me is simply Google my name. There's like a hundred YouTube videos of me teaching. So go for that. Good. Can your practice treat PTSD? I'm going to say you'd want to be careful with that. Um, some PTSD, the answer is yes. Some PTSD, the answer is no. Some PTSD is so serious that their nervous system has become rewired. And I'd be very careful using cognitive affective things as a sole treatment modality in the same way that I'd be very careful to use mindfulness as a sole treatment modality for PTSD. You'd want to combine it with other things. However, Having worked with multiple people who have had family members murdered, I have seen this be very effective because some of the PTSD is not so much like from real direct trauma, but from partly how we articulate it and from some of the practices that we do. So if you get more sleep, if you change your diet, if you improve your exercise, if you practice some cognitive reframing, if you meditate, those will calm your nervous system down for people who have less serious case of neurological hijacking. And in those cases, this can be very valuable. So my answer to that is be cautious. That, that would be my answer to that. Um, <laughs> Why do we seem to pick people as mates? And this is in all caps. <laughs> Why do we seem to pick people as mates who suffer from the anger and unforgiveness and have major issues? Okay. That, there's a couple of answers to that. One is we tend to look for people with the same ability of intimacy that we have. Often we'll choose people very different than we are, but our fears and our, in, our blocks to intimacy is the same. So sometimes if we're an angry person, we'll choose a somebody who never expresses themselves. But both of us are scared of honest communication. Both of us are afraid of being vulnerable. We do it differently. So generally speaking, happier marriages have either similar rates of intimacy or one partner who's so healthy that they can handle the craziness of the less healthy partner. That, that's, that's about all you have for a healthy relationship is equal or one person much more capable and much more patient. However, when you have an angry person or a person who's suppressing all their anger, their lack of skill tends to reinforce the lack of skill in their partner. So if every time I come to you, you yell at me, I'm going to either shut up or I'm going to yell back. So we reinforce each other's bad habits. That's, that's partly my answer to you. Why do we seem to pick people? Even if we don't pick them that way, we help turn them into people that way. <laughs> That's right. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's, and, and there's some research on attachment 
and, and relationship satisfaction. So if you have two people who have secure attachment, they're going to do pretty good. If you have two people who have avoidant attachment, they're going to turn into a disaster. Mm -hmm. If you have one person with avoidant attachment and one person with anxious attachment, they're going to drive each other crazy. If you have somebody with anxious attachment with a secure attachment person, they can generally make it work because the secure attachment person can mask it. If you have somebody with avoidant attachment and another person with secure attachment, sometimes they can make it work because the cure person can um, deal with the, the isolation of the avoidant person. So there's global factors in terms of our ability to connect. And then the simple truth that if we have either anger expressed or suppressed, we're going to tend to bring it out in our partner. And therefore, that's how you see it so much in couples who practice a lot with each other. All right. Fred, thank you so much. Um, yeah, let, I, I'm, I'll take one more. Well, and then you're, I, you're welcome to stay uh, longer, of course. But uh, I want to use or respect your commitments. No, I, I know. Um, just humans have no purpose on the earth, so we make up rules and purpose. I don't know that we have no purpose on this earth. I, I think there may be multiple purposes on this earth, but there's, there's too many reports from spiritual savants, from too many converging sources, that there may be a purpose, there, that kindness, love, learning, something may be built into us also as purposes on this planet. So I don't think it's that harsh. We make up rules to protect ourselves in how we deal with reality. And it is true, we make up our own idiosyncratic purpose, but I'm not convinced that there aren't bigger forces that have purposes for us to discover. That would be my answer to that. Yeah, the, anyway, thank you all. Just a minute, Fred. Uh, I did some work in the area of happiness, and the conclusion from the professionals was that happiness is a byproduct, not a product, and that it comes from having a relationship with a meaning broader than ourselves and a contribution to humanity around us. And it, it comes from two other things, Herb. It comes from good relationships with other people and the ability to savor one's life with gratitude. Nice. Those are the only real predictors of happiness. There you go. What a great way to bring this event to conclusion. And I can hardly wait for us to calendar something in 2022. Thanks. Thank, you, very much. thank you all very much. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. I had broken uh, my, we had a breakup with my fiance. And I told that story from July until January to everybody, what he did to me. And it was only until I read that book and Dr. Luskin says, don't tell the story. Don't drop the story. It's just, you're never gonna heal from that. And then the rules. So it was in January, I read the book. I was able to drop the story. I got a sense of freedom. And that is when it was real clear for me to make a healthy ninth step. And mm -hmm. when I made the ninth step, I was free. I was free. And that man doesn't matter what he did. He's a wonderful person. So thank you so much for, I mean, yeah. you said it over and over again, the year that we were together to read that book. And I'm, and I'm glad I did. And I'm glad you told me it was your favorite because you told me so many books. I couldn't keep up with all of them. No, all right, right. Well, thank you very much because that's a total confirmation of two things. Number one, there's a, there is a process and it's slow. 
And but there are specific things that we can do, and it just takes time for us to incorporate them, digest them, activate them. And uh, I'm going to give you a, another book, all of you. Uh, Rami Shapiro, R A M I, he's a rabbi, he's in a 12 step program, Shapiro. <laughs> Loving Kindness. It's his most recent book. It's just terrific. It's short chapters, uh, little med probably meditations. Uh, there are two, maybe three pages long on various aspects of uh, loving kindness. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Luskin gave us uh, a taste of it today in his three meditations, which was wonderful. Uh, totally unexpected on my part. And it was just wonderful to experience. So thank you so much. Uh, my first question is, is uh, where do we get the skills to cope with life and grief? If, there, if it's a skill to grieve, I'd like to know where to get those. There uh, well, let, me, let me take them one at a time. There's a book called Grief Recovery Handbook. Oh, I, I would here. recommend that. It's written by a couple of guys uh, in a 12-step pro, uh, program. And they also have the Grief Recovery Institute. And oh, they wow. do... And they do trainings for people to lead uh, people in groups for uh, the grief process. The grief process, as Luskin indicated, is very much like Kubler-Ross's process and um, also like the 12-step process. So all of these are human processes. The dynamics are the same. The vocabulary and some of the uh, process steps are different. But essentially, essentially, it's the same process. So my experience with the 12-step process for me, is the underlying skeleton that I can identify with and then take these various other recommendations okay. and kind of understand and work them myself. Okay. So you had another question. I do. So isn't it like a basic function of our ego that we fear being annihilated or fear not existing, which makes us human? And yet at the exact same time, we have to reconcile with the thought, it's not about me. And I don't know how to put those two things together. So the question is, how do I reconcile the, fear, the, no. the, the, the ego fear of not existing, and then yet it's not about me? Um, if it's too big, you can skip that. Oh, no, no, no. I, I think that's uh, steps 10, 11, and 12, quite frankly. Uh, yeah. I'm not the center of the world. I am the center of my world. And if I want to live in the world, I want to know that I have a perspective that I live in the world and that the best way to live in the world is to take care of myself and to contribute to other people. There's the balance. It's really that. I think it's that simple. And as Luskin said, not easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I need. Thanks. Oh, thanks very much. A lot of us hang out in our feelings because it seems safe, like he talked about. Could you talk about, if you know, uh, I come across a lot of people that I work with and sponsor. I spend a lot of time trying to under, have them understand just of the fact of what a real feeling is. Shitty is not a feeling. Right. It's a concept. So I, I, I just, I'll say this, and then you can respond to it. I was taught mad, sad, glad, afraid, ashamed, hurt, at least the six basic feelings. Mm -hmm that I got early on in treatment, actually, that was very good. Do you, how do you uh, help people recognize that layer so that they can kind of get down a little, be able to drill down? Do you have some sort of a template to that or how does that work for you? Yeah, I, I try two different, and you're absolutely right, especially men have a real difficult time identifying that they have feelings, let alone what they are. Um, don't have to talk about that much, but so I, I, I approach it two ways, both one academically or intellectually, that we have instincts, survival instincts, and, and Luskin talks so much about being safe. This is it. It's a survival thing, being safe. And we have three instincts in us. We have the um, fight, flight, and freeze instincts. Those are biological that go into emotional instincts go to emotions. That's our brain stem goes to our limbic system as an automatic response to a perception of threat. Fight becomes anger, flight becomes fear, freeze becomes dishonesty, camouflage, hiding, shame. All right, <clears throat> and so given that as a sort of a construct, 
then I have when people are mm, in the fourth step, especially, and many of you have seen me do it, I tell people, all right, put your hand on your heart. Get out of your head. Come from this place. It's just a, a technique possibly for people to have a feeling coming from their heart, getting out of the concept and out of the ideas and the analysis and the logic of the head. And then also put your hand on your gut because that's where a different feeling comes from. Your heart perhaps processes fear, maybe shame. Your gut processes uh, fear, all right? But I literally have people put their hands so that there is some kind of uh, embodiment uh, pro uh, engagement where they can attempt to move out of their head from the analytical concept, logic, words, to the, the actual feeling of it. And a lot of times it works. Oh, and then in, in treatment, uh, you're right, you reminded me of something. They actually gave us an eight by 11 with about 60 pictures of different facials with an emotion underneath so that you could actually see uh, the word um, of the emotion uh, with the, the expression on the face, just so that you could begin to, to see that there's so many variations on the emotions and subtleties in the differences. That was it, Herb. That was beautiful. Okay, thank all you. Right, all right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's good to think about things and to know things, but it's much better once you know something to have an experience with it, to embody it. That's the words that the Gestalt people use to embody yeah. it so that you can actually have a different experience and relationship with it. Thanks very much. Hi, Herb. Wonderful. That was so awesome. So grateful uh, we were able to uh, attend. You're, you're cut out there, Paul. On mute. There How's you, that? There you go. Very good. All right. Okay. So in the fourth column, you said, what am I doing? What am I, what am I thinking? What am I doing? What am I fearing? Uh, where am I dishonest? What is my responsibility, and yeah. I I love that. And then uh, the third column I've 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 used, you know, with you the unenforceable rule. Can you talk about both of those together, and you know, the hopeful oh yeah. the final score that emerges from that? Yeah, um, I would recommend it somebody who wants to go deep into third and fourth column and my interpretation of it from the big book. It's an expansion and a depth that doesn't. The big book doesn't reflect, but people who have taken me through the work have taught me how to expand and, and create an experience with it. So go to YouTube on my uh, presentation or discussion of uh, column uh, of uh, step four resentments, especially. But uh, my short answer to that is that column three is about our beliefs, the shoulds, yes. the shoulds in our life. These unenforceable rules that Dr. Luskin talked about. And the fourth column is about our motives. Yes. What are, what are the motives? And, and to see that our motives are corrupt. So our beliefs are delusional oh. and our oh. motives are corrupt. And the combination is our life. <laughs> yes, that's the result. That's awesome. Another <laughs> observation, too, you know, Dr. Luskin talked about we bring people into our life who have similar levels of intimacy capability. And I was at one of your uh, workshops, we were with uh, Dr. Berger, and yeah. one of you talked about how in an addictive or dysfunctional family, it's kind of like a mobile over a baby's bed. It's kind uh, of a- Yeah, that was, a, uh, uh, that was an image and a metaphor given to me in the hospital program that my wife was in back in 1984. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful image, go ahead. Well, that, that, yeah, and it's got its own, people play their roles, they know how to freak out at the appropriate time, and it's got this sort of unhealthy balance, for lack of a better word, and that anything that kind of disrupts that, say, for instance, a partner trying to grow, is a healthy thing. 
and uh, wondered if you had some more but observations. Sure. Well, just, just to make sure people have the image, it's a, the mobile over a baby's crib has six or seven or eight, whatever it is, uh, dangling things from it. And it's all in balance and it goes around and it makes music and it's quite peaceful. But if you took one of those things off of one of the seven things off of it, it would go cattywampus like this. And so it's out of balance. And that's what they call the family systems theory about uh, uh, especially dysfunction in any form of trauma, but especially with regard to addiction. That, and what you just said is if one of the person gets sober and the others are not in sync with that, it's going to create uh, obviously a split at that time and the people are going to grow apart. That's inevitable. Yeah. So awesome. Thanks. Well, I've said enough. Thank you, Herb. I had a question in regards to a lot of people or a few people that I know are really interested in doing trauma therapy, yeah. um, not PTSD, but just trauma therapy. I, I don't want to like it's uh, Gabor Mate, for instance, is really into that. And I'm just wondering, is that not just kind of uh, what's the word? reliving it and going back into the story and the victimhood i, I mean i'm not saying you don't acknowledge i'm not a professional it. i'm not a psychologist i don't know but i think they would respond i believe in fact luskin touched on it that in therapy you have to go back and reconnect to the experience yeah. in order mm -hmm. to reframe it that's the little right. bit that i know about it um, and there is a book called Trauma and Recovery. I forget the name of the author, but it was just excellent. Trauma and Recovery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I, and now just one more thing, and then I like it's that thing called it that triggers me, that triggers me. And so that almost tells me then that, uh, uh, oh, it's another way that I have an excuse to feel bad. Then I, uh, agree. I haven't. No, I've had people come to me it. and say, Herb, they're pressing my buttons. And yeah. I said, get rid of the buttons. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, get rid of the buttons. That's your problem. It's not yeah. It's not the world's problem. It's your problem. Yeah. If you, if you have buttons, that, they can press it. <laughs> right. But what, what you're saying, though, is you got to know what the buttons are and understand maybe why they're there. Or, you know, that's I mean. why <laughs> that's why the step four inventory like we do yeah. it is so powerful because we get underneath our consciousness. We literally get underneath our unconsciousness to surface the root cause so that we can then determine maybe professional med uh, uh, help is necessary or even medication for, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for today. I've got a lot from it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my, my recent grief is a passing of my mother. And um, I'm now dealing with the, my brothers and closing down the estate. Oh, yes. And uh, <clears throat> there's pain for me because I've, I've done a lot for my mom the last four years and my one brother has not shown up at all. Sure, but now sure. it's the call is I want, I want, I want. Sure, I need, of course. I need. It's yeah. not like, hey, bird, thank you for all that you've done. Right, of course. Uh, no. can, thank you for all that hard work and how can I help you? It's right. I need, I want, I want, I want. So. I'm trying to navigate that because yes. I understand our work and I think I have it until I see his email come up or his phone call come in sure. and my body contracts and I'm in and I'm, and I'm, and I'm hurt and I'm, and I'm angry sure. and I don't want to be like this all the time, but I am right now. And I'm suffering because of the pain right. that I keep experiencing. Right. And I'm starting to realize when I asked him a little bit about his pain points, they're exactly my pain points because we uh, grew up in the same family. I don't oh, feel seen and I don't feel heard. Mm -hmm. I can tell 10 stories of what that is, but that's what it sure. boils down to. Sure. And that's how I feel. And so um, I hear from you, I get upset with myself, like I should be over this. I have enough recovery. I understand the force. <laughs> Did you hear yourself? I should be. Mm -hmm. There's a, perhaps there's a unrealistic expectation my personal experience, my wife died three years ago, took two years for me to have some stability. I thought after six months, I'm good now. Mm -hmm. And then the next six months, I realized I wasn't. Mm -hmm. 
but then after about two years, I really knew I was okay. I, I started my new life for real. And it was, yeah, sad, but not that much connected anymore. So my sense is there's a process here. Are you the executor? I am. Yeah, that makes it difficult. Have you sat down with your brother and explained your role and, and your concern about his uh, mm, questions and conference with you? I have after I got a letter from his lawyer. <laughs> uh, did you have a lawyer that helps you? Uh, good. There you go. We do, we do yep. now because that's how his his stance was to be very forceful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in one of the uh, ethnic groups to remain unnamed, uh, one of the women said, where there's a will, there's a relative. <laughs> Well, I find for me what's coming up, I mean, it comes up in so many layers, but I'm grieving my mom. Yeah. And I'm also grieving, and now I'm really grieving that I think the reality that's not true about who my brother is and who I thought he was as my brother. Yeah. A brother should be this, and, you know, and a brother should yeah. be that. And particularly a twin brother, right? This is my twin brother. Yeah. And it's just like, wow, I'm adding to my suffering. And I'm, and I'm like, wow, he's not really been there the way I've always thought he should. And I'm kind of waiting like, oh, this will be it. Yeah. And it's not. Reality is what reality is. And it's cold and it's immutable and it's non-negotiable. And the last thing I'll say um, is I think the, vo the, the story I tell myself now that I'm starting to see with age and the wisdom of seeing a, a story is I say, well, look at all I've done for you. Look at all I did for mom. Exactly. Look at all I did for my family. And, like, and you're expecting gratitude. Yep. Get That's over right. it. Mm -hmm. It's just, how not, you, it's just how not reality. Get, how do I get over that? Oh, yeah. First of all, acknowledge that it's not realistic. Mm -hmm. you're, you're wishing for fairy dust. Yeah. So there's a process. All right. Thanks. I just made some notes while you were talking and while Fred was talking. Yeah. And one of the things he emphasizes in his book is that forgiveness is for you and not the offender. And yeah. I don't think he talked about that today, but we talk about it in the program for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And he talked also about how he got interested in this forgiveness process way back when, when his best friend, I think if I recall uh, correctly from the book, his best friend got a relationship and wasn't available to be his best friend anymore. And he got tremendously resentful about it. Mm. And he got interested in the process of how he could get rid of that resentment. Uh -huh. So... I know I got interested in this process because I'm an alcoholic yeah. and I came into the program of AA and I try to follow the steps. Yeah. So it's interesting that uh, I would say that both he and I have had a change in how we think and feel yeah. and act yeah. as a result of something that would appear to be negative. Yes. But in the program, we call it a spiritual awakening. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So anyways, we're, we're told in the program that resentment, um, and I think resentment is a, a, a refusal to forgive, uh, is the number one offender and it yeah. destroys more of us than anything else. So I paid attention to that and I, I, I try to figure out a way, how do I deal with this? Um, and I recognize now that behind, and I'm looking at my notes, behind every resentment, I have some blame based upon a judgment. Yeah. So yeah. I think I'm wrong. And this person did something that breached yeah. my sense of what's right. Yeah. And judgment makes me view the world as I am rather than as that person is. Right. And it's kind of interesting. So in the program, we talk about how uh, these resentments really are based upon uh, ego and self-centeredness and things like that. So resentment is I, I, I didn't get my way at some time in the past and I'm not willing to release that. So I'm upset about that. 
Yeah. And I didn't get my way today, so I'm angry about it. Yeah. And right. with anger in the program too. And I'm worried that maybe tomorrow I'm not going to get my own way. And so I'm upset about that. So it's all selfishness, self-centeredness. And I think that's the root cause of all of this. Yes. Yeah. yeah well, and, and, and in fact, even Luskin said that, which was surprised me. I mean, he actually used a lot of our terminology without being in a 12-step program. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah. And he talked about Viktor Frankl in yeah. his book and things like that and having a purpose. And then, you know, truth is truth. Yeah, right. And there's a, lo a lot of different ways to get there. Yeah. And in his book, he talks a lot about different parts of, of spiritual uh, systems and, and religious religious ways to get here also. Yeah. And I, it's really easy. You know, I'm so happy that I'm part of a 12-step program because it really is a lot easier to get to this way yes. of forgiveness than, than not. It's just so much easier. So anyways, thanks very much for doing this. Today. You're, you're welcome. Yeah, I thought it was, uh, what, it, was it exceeded my expectations in many ways, one of which was he was much more inclusive of uh, spirituality and the concepts and the terms than I thought he would be, because I thought he was a rigorous, cold uh, uh, scientist, and uh, he clearly had embraced the full world of uh, religious traditions as well as the spiritual technologies and, and uh, uh, vocabulary that m many of us use. So I, I was very surprised pleased. And of course, uh, he's the kind of person I had hoped he would be, which would be uh, knowledgeable but, and inclusive, which was... Yeah, just, well, some of us some of us change as we get older and more experienced. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, there is a, a, a little bit of a, a, a shift, I believe, um, if he said that, I don't remember him saying that, we do forgiveness for ourselves. The big book suggestion is my experience because I came at forgiveness after I finished the ninth step, releasing everybody else, I realized I had been released. And so the big book suggests in the ninth step that although we are trying to, you know, clean up our own stuff, the primary purpose of making an amend is to be useful. Yeah. And, and so uh, the priority is their freedom the paradox is my freedom. That's my yeah. experience with the 12-step process. And if we want to be happy, maybe that's an indirect way of doing yeah, it because as I you know, we have yeah. to we have to be useful to others. But he, yeah. he talked in his book about forgiveness is for you and not the offender right, right near the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I made notes in relation to that. And he had a bunch of really neat bullet points. Forgiveness is taking back your power. Mm -hmm. It's taking responsibility for how we feel. Yeah. It's about healing you and not about the people who hurt you. And yeah. it goes on and on. And oh, on. from that standpoint, I do agree with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and then he was talking about positive thinking in terms of the compassion discussion, positive thinking and how that brings healing to us. And of course, we, we talk about prayer, not only prayer for the other person's healing, but prayer for our own healing, the removal of deep resentments. And uh, there was a very big parallel in that. Yeah, and, and when I don't mean to say anything negative when he was talking about what would motivate him to do sessions like this. Mm -hmm. It's three different ways. One yeah. is when he gets paid for it and things like I felt like saying, well, you know, if you really want to be happy, we learn in the program. Uh, is to be useful to other people. But, uh, you know, it's not me. Not, not. Well, but this is his profession. This is his way of living. And so that's how I'd rather be rich and spiritual than poor and spiritual. Well, that's right. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing wrong with making money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Hi, Herb. Um, that was fabulous. I just yeah. love him. That was so great. And, you know, I was just... Um, I think my question's been answered already, but I, I wondered, like, my first initial question was, you know, how do you know you've forgiven someone? And the answer is if you stop telling the story about them, about how they hurt you. That would be one, one certainly good indicator, right? Because I keep thinking, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic. The person I've had the most trouble with in my life is my father, and his birthday would have been today. And I thought, isn't that ironic? Because here we are in this workshop, you know? And... 
<laughs> I kind of thought I had forgiven him, but I realized the other day I was telling a story about him, hmm. about where the hurt came from. And I thought, oh no, there it is. There it is, <laughs> you know? Um, so maybe that's, that's the answer is to not tell that story to myself or other people anymore. Right. And to also examine, is there anything that's unforgiven and would some aspect of the ninth step be applicable to that, where you would engage in a process that will give you the freedom from the memory, from the feeling, from the conversation, from the story? Oh, yes, I see that. Yeah. 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 Because that's that's where I had done all my nine step amends and then somehow came across the entire concept of forgiveness. And that's when I made my study of it and then met Fred uh, Luskin. Um, so uh, it was a way of explaining, quite frankly, the experience that I had in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Herb, is to kind of look at that in the steps. Yeah. There might be something residual going on because I've, you know, I've done a lot of work around him in that right. relationship. And I think they're probably right. something else. And I just had a, a quick thing, a question. Otherwise, is he's, uh, Fred said something about um, when he mentioned PTSD, he said something like he would not use his techniques in that. I didn't really right. get that. He that? said he, uh, it was more from a psychological sophistication standpoint. He was making a distinction between hardcore PTSD and perhaps lighter touch PTSD. That was what I got from him because I think he was making a, 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 a distinction between almost biological, deep psychological systemic problems rather than other types of emotional and or sociological problems. I just got a sense that he was making a distinction between severe, which he didn't want to touch, and sort of the lighter uh, traumas that people can experience, which could be handled by the process that he was discussing. Oh, so how do you know which one you fall under? <laughs> you don't well, even... again, that, that would be probably getting an evaluation from a professional. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thank so much. Thanks. Thanks so much. Ashley, please. Hey, Herb. Oh, Hi. Man. Thank you so much. Wow. Thanks for having this space for us. I just wanted to say, uh, I wanted to say something and I have a question for you. Uh, you know, that the multiple um, meditations, you know, I've done your Wednesday night meditation, but doing the meditation in this format was so powerful. I don't, know, yeah. I don't know if anyone else cried, but I was just streaming tears by the end when mm. I kept saying, I want to be happy, they want to be happy, mm. you know, and, and then for everyone I haven't met yet, like I want, and then it also just showed me that, thing, the joy that came out of my body, thinking about people coming into my life, it just showed me how trapped my brain is in, mm. in the past. Um, but from reading that book and, and the amount of work I've done in your workshops over the years, um, you know, it just shows me that when I am able to, well, when I connect and, and somehow it comes through me. Yeah. That I'm able to be shown my grievance story, whatever's <laughs> taking place in the moment, you know, right, right. that everything just really comes down to like, oh yeah, that's one of the ways people think. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the ways people behave. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the ways people die. Like <laughs> that's yeah. one of the ways people cope. That's like, you know, it that was the point that he made that was just terrific. That these were just unhealthy coping strategies. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and I did a whole in, in my my um 11 step the other morning. I just started started off with those three, and then I went cope, and then I just went to all the answers that like, you know, that's one of the ways people spend money. Like, where are my like where everything pops up, you know? Um you know, um, that's one of the way, you know, whatever it ha happens, that's one of the ways people lose money. That's one of the ways people earn money. That's sure. Well, one of the things um, also but... was the perspective they gave us 
that he reminded me of is like there's seven billion people. I'm one yeah. little tiny, you know, <laughs> grain of sand on the beach. It's kind of like that's a perspective of humility. Yeah. Oh, and it's so funny when I catch myself in the thing, when I catch myself doing a theorem of why, what happened, what happened, and I'm hit with like, oh yeah, that's just like. <laughs> An event that happens when he was saying, whatever you're going through right now, someone else is going through at the same time or has been through, yeah. you know? So when you just take the me, 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 me out of it, it's so freeing and very funny to see how self-important we need to make ourselves. But um, I, on a more um, action-oriented uh, question, with the, with the thing about the interrupting and the husband, um, to clarify as someone who can be a doormat and freeze and not say anything in that moment, I would just say, could you please not interrupt me? Like, or, and, and then I'll give you a moment to respond or uh, like without controlling the person's behavior, but right. still advocating for like, you know, delineating there is this kind of respect you'd like in the moment without being a victim, speaking right. up for yourself, or saying, say someone, you know, said something and saying, um, I feel sad when you say that, or that hurt me. How do you say these types of things? Or, or just when someone's behaving a certain way, maybe request that they don't without making yourself a victim yeah. or, and knowing that they might not, you know, I'm not outcome oriented. I could say, oh. please don't interrupt me. And you continue to interrupt me. And I see that he's an interrupter. The, um, the technique that they taught us in the hospital, which I've never forgotten 37 years later was tell them what you see, tell them its impact on you and tell them what you want. It's never about them. This is what I see. This is the impact on me. This is what I want. It's a really simple uh, communication technique. And when I remember it, it really works. <laughs> that is wonderful. That yeah. answers my question. So. It was really great how you brought in the 12th step at the beginning and where forgiveness like is embedded throughout. And I loved your slide about what forgiveness is and is not. It's such yeah. a great reminder. Uh, thank you. One thing I wanted to ask is um, that, that anger, the uh, dealing with anger. I mean, in order for us to forgive, it's probably, I, I, oh, well, let me pay, uh, speak personally. I feel angry towards a situation, an institution, a country, a government, uh, my mother, like, and in order to forgive, like Vaskin said, is I, I need to not be angry <laughs> because anger, like, doesn't let you see clearly. And no, it, makes, it was so good. He says, no, it makes you stupid. It makes me stupid. And it does make me stupid. Yes. And I love it. <laughs> my question to you is, I mean, one, as a woman, and two, like, just culturally, I've never been able to, one, recognize anger in me. I don't, you know, in terms of a feeling, like, I can't tell you I'm angry. Like, it's not something I can express because I don't let myself feel it, one. And two, I mean, from a social norm perspective, um, it's, it's, not acceptable to show anger or to express anger, yep. and especially if you're a woman. I mean, let's I yep. let's face it. So, yep. my question to you is: How can we channel that anger? That I learned today, if it's short term, mm -hmm. can be a motivator, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. But without it becoming like unmanageable, like or leading to a to a, a life that's unmanageable yeah well um we're talking about emotional sobriety oh that is that's right emotional anger uh, sobriety 
management so that it's not out of control. Oh. And, and so rather than trying to identify the specific feeling, because I, I think most men actually could relate to what you just articulated, and <clears throat> as we talked about earlier. And so the 12 and 12 uses the term disturbed. Right. If I'm disturbed, it's because yeah. there's emotion. Right. It might be fear, it might be anger, it might be shame. There's some there's some instinct in me that tells me I'm unsafe, so I'm disturbed. So use that broad term anytime I'm disturbed. I don't need to know what? clearly what the vocabulary is. I am disturbed. <laughs> then then you can use the formula of the 10 step. And okay. so the key, the key, the absolute key is consciousness. That's right. That I'm aware that I'm disturbed because I'll bet you you've got, you've had a, a history like I had where you were disturbed and didn't know you were disturbed, but you were so disturbed. Exactly. Yeah, I'm usually in the food before be, before knowing that I'm disturbed, right? Uh, well, whatever it was, yeah. Oh. Exactly, exactly. So that's why um, I think um, his uh, surprise uh, disclosure to me the other day when we were talking that he's been a meditator for 40 years. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, well, yes, he's more conscious. Of course, now he's a trained psychologist, so he's even more conscious. Yeah. And that's why the 12-step process is so powerful because it makes us conscious that the total point Hello, listen to step 12. Awaken. That's about consciousness. That's right. Staying conscious in step 10, improving consciousness in step 11, enlarging consciousness in step 12. It doesn't get any better and more focused than that. Beautiful. Yeah, it is actually. I'm I'm so excited and grateful that we have this program and that we have uh, people who are interested in consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm in the process of reading his book now. Okay. And I'm on chapter five, so I still have a ways to go. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also in the middle of my, my ninth step. Mm -hmm. And Oh, um, good timing, actually. Good yeah. timing in terms of all three of the things. Good. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just want to make a couple comments and then I, I, I'm actually going to ask a question that somebody else asked, but I, I didn't get all the answer. Sure. Uh, two things that really struck me when he was talking uh, was this, you know, this aha around of course, we're going to have more negative emotions than positive emotions. Because that was a surprise to me. I, I didn't know that information. Yeah. Well, but it makes sense, right? Yeah. If mm -hmm. my amygdala is hijacked, yeah. I'm going to be in fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. So that's going to generate a lot of you know, defensiveness and right. anger. Neg or or uh, fear or ne negative, you know, negative emotions. And yes. so that was really just the way he put that. You know, it just took away like one of the thing, the bats that I use on my back about when I say, you know, I'm just, I'm too negative. I should be more positive. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was really, you know, so interesting. And then he also, which ties into that, he also talks so much about safety. Yes, yes, yes. I was very impressed with that. Yes. Yeah, it, it was so helpful to me that the only time that we really feel safe is if we are relaxed and breathing deeply. So again, if we're in fight, flight, and freeze, and let's face it, we're in that state most of the time because we're wired to do that. It just reinforced for me, you know, how important breathing is in my in my meditation. And I I don't always remember it. You know, I go into my meditation and I just don't always stay focused on that. So I well, sometimes in my meditation, I actually become aware that I'm holding my breath. Yes. <laughs> It's kind of like it's ridiculous because I, I, there's a there's a tension that I, unconsciously I'm just I don't know why but anyway there you go. 
well, and I think I hold my breath a lot. Oh, you know? so yeah. of course I do it. I do it sometimes when I'm meditating. Yeah. All of that was, it just, again, like so many things that I've learned from you is that to just be more gentle with myself because I'm just human. It was a wonderful reinforcement, wasn't it? Yep. Humanity. Uh, now, the thing that I wanted to ask you again, uh, um, someone brought it up and I wrote down the first question and then I, I lost the rest of it. And that was um, one of, uh, you know, I have a baby sister and I'm, I was shocked because I was getting prepared to make amends and I was talking to my step guide and I just went berserk, right? I just, my experience, I just like flew off the handle, you know, and started screaming. And so we decided I'm probably not ready. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. So I have, you know, I read this part about stop the story and I'm stopping the story and I'm praying but I heard you say something else you know that there was there was something else just to somebody two or three people ago yeah. that we can do about yes. that can you yeah. I'm sorry could you repeat that I, I I want to actually thank you for bringing it back to the discussion and that's the prayer that Bill indicates very specifically and at length uh, in the middle of the resentment inventory, pages 66 and 67, he talks about a prayer practice for the removal of deep resentment, for the removal of deep resentment. Now, I would recommend that you listen to one of my recordings on that and um, also go to, to my way of life document because there's a, there's a prayer that I've scripted from that material, mostly from the material, but also from my experience that I prayed to get rid of deep resentment. And over several months, they were all removed and they've never returned. Well, I am. I, I think I've done that, but I'm going to oh. go back, go back yeah. it, just, uh, to reinforce that. Yeah. And, no, it just also may be that I am. Um, it sounds like you have a new awareness. Yeah, yeah, I do have more of an awareness, and so yeah. maybe that will help because uh, I, it's like I, I'd like to be done with the prayers on this one and you know move 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 on. But um, I get there. I there just must be a lot more I've got to learn about this thing that's going on with my. Well, life. your new consciousness is an invitation to some additional work. Yeah, think of it positively. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when he said, the simple truth is that I don't know how to cope with my life. Yeah. That hit me with neon lights because yeah. that's step one. And we are right in the middle of step one on Thursday and Friday. And yeah. it was like, yeah. You know, the simple truth, the simple truth. Yeah. It was, it, it, it just blew me away. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, that made such a difference in what I was hearing, well, besides the safety, because the safety thing was important, but he's, he kept mentioning practice, that we have to practice these things yeah we don't just do it and it's a one and done but it's a practice yep. and i am getting very discouraged i have a deep fear of success and i have been doing my morning practice ever since july when you first mentioned it and i get to, to uh day 28 and stop and I'm now back up to day five. And um, I just, day 28, just, it's, it's like, remember, it's like when I talked about the fork in the road is a, a big wall that I keep hitting. Day 28, I keep hitting. And I keep, I know that practice is what I need. And I know that it's important. But there's something that stops me. All right. So um, I'm getting frustrated and fearful. Get back on the bike and pedal. <laughs>
thank you so much. Thank yep. you. Thank Get you. back Just on the bike right and pedal. Okay. You, you've got training wheels on, and um, you will go into step four, and you'll dig deep into the obstacles that bump you off the bike at 28 days. Okay. If, it, if it's still true at that point. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, you know, and we can smile and joke about it because it's a process. All right. So it's not the end of life. It's kind of like, yeah, th that's right. right. 28 days and you get bumped off. Yep. And then you begin again. Yep. That's how it works for you. Not for somebody else, yeah. but for you. This is your journey. I, I can't explain it right now, but in at the end of this year or the end of the workshop by next year, June, you will explain it and you will have a lot more empathy and sympathy for yourself at that point. But you'll it's, also it's probably not right. get bumped off at 28 days. <laughs> as much as I joke about this process, it is becoming very, very serious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the I the attitude. There's a yeah. It's becoming real serious. So I thank you for I thank you for what you're doing in my life. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, I was taught we, we take the process serious. We don't take ourselves serious. Yeah, thanks so much. My experience with um, working with sponsees through their fourth step is that it's easier for them to forgive others oh, than yeah. it is to forgive themselves, oh, yeah. especially if they, are, if they were perpetrators of child abuse or child neglect. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess the insight that I made um, today uh, from Fred is that I think there's a lot of grieving that needs to happen. Oh, yeah. just a lot, of, a lot of grieving. And, and I just wondered if you had any other thoughts about that. Uh, no, I don't. It, 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 just to highlight and reinforce, double reinforce what you said. As we go through steps four and five, especially, there's a lot of grieving that needs to take place in ourselves for the impact we've had on our own life. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, I think about that term right size that we use yeah. a lot in the rooms. And yeah. I think, you know, we learned to right size to God that we're not yeah. God. We learn to right size to others and, and respect boundaries. But I think a third thing is to right size to ourselves, That's this true. ideal self that we carry around. Yeah. And we have to really let that go yeah. because most of us didn't have an ideal life. Right. Uh, and, and so a lot of us just uh, did the things that were done to us, you know? Yes, ab own. absolutely. We just pass it on. That's right. Yeah. It's like we pass it on like eye color, you know? It's like, yeah. And, and that, that right sizing the ideal self to the real self, again, to, to accepting yeah. reality yeah. Of, of where we were and how we got to where we are. Yeah. Accepting it so much about acceptance, you know? Yeah. It just yeah. is about acceptance. In, in, in the spirit of that, you might want to read or reread chapter seven from the 12 and 12. It's about humility. Yeah. That's a, that's the perspective of being right-sized. Humility mm -hmm. comes from the Latin humus, meaning earth or dirt. I'm, I'm, I'm not unique. I'm one of many. And that was the point he made. I'm one of 7 billion people. And right now, a billion of them are suffering, <laughs> at least, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's like I'm not unique in living this life of struggle. That's right. Thank you. No, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have another question and also like to make a comment on what Dr. Laskin uh, talked about. What really touched me was when he talked about what turns our brain into moosh. When he talked about electronics, being busy, um, multitasking, I'm like, oh my goodness, yes. I was wondering how people were receiving that. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I, I was, yeah, um, yes, I, I see a lot of that and I have, I, I'm glad that I'm in program that I'm not doing it as much, but I do some. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, my question was, I heard you um, mention it earlier and I missed um, the three points. Uh, you talked about uh, the consciousness, the three levels of consciousness in step 10, 11, and 12. I got 12 that it enlarges uh, consciousness and I missed in 10, 11. Um, my interpretation of step 10 is uh, conscience. Conscience, yes. Conscience. Mm -hmm. And it's about, Bill uses the term watch for. All right, so he's talking about vigilance. In other, in other words, just paying attention, paying attention to being disturbed, like I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Because if we're in the flow, look at my hands. If we're in the flow, we're not disturbed. If we have serenity and peace, we're not disturbed. It's only when we're at cross purposes with the life flow that we get disturbed. I don't care what you call it. Anger, fear, shame, guilt. I don't care what you call it. Hiding, camouflage, dishonesty. Whatever the disturbance is, it means that we're out of alignment with our own principles. It's not magic. It's not like I don't have to know theology. I don't have to know philosophy. I just have to be in touch with my own principles. Because when I transgress my principles... Everything in me knows it, and I get disturbed. Yeah, great question. And then step 11 and 12, how it relates to that? Well, I use the word from the step itself, improving mm -hmm. my conscious. Okay. It's about consciousness. And in mm -hmm. step 12, I use the word enlarge from page 14, where he says we perfect and enlarge our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. No, those are it's, Thank you. Ar it's very arbitrary, but mm -hmm. it really helps yeah. me to have a logic to uh, the process. Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you. All right, Thank thanks you. very much. Um, wow, all right, I'm almost reluctant to stop. It's been so good, it's kind of like uh, an addiction, isn't it? <laughs> Once you start, you cannot stop. But anyway, we're going to have to bring it to a, a gentle conclusion here. Let's see if I uh, have something here that can be gentle. Maybe the prayer of St. Francis and see what we can do with that. Yeah, we know it's a process. This is, this is Fred's outline of his book, by the way. Name it, understand it, identify the rules, acknowledge reality, responsibility, take it and implement some action. Sound familiar? Yeah, he's got six stages of forgiveness, the process, and we just happen to spread it out over 12 steps. Really seriously, that they're very complementary and parallel. Forgiveness is a change in our attitude, a change by accepting reality as it is, and a change in our actions. I did not realize that this phrase came from, I think he said Tutu, Desmond Tutu, but it certainly was part of a meditation I had several years ago. A forgiving person has no past. An unforgiving person has no future. Let's pray the prayer of transformation. Lord, make me a channel of your peace that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, Grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds, it is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. <laughs>